born unequal. There are social class differences in both teenage conceptions and births, but the differences are smaller for conceptions than for births because middle-class young women are more likely to have abortions. Teenage birth rates are higher in communities that also have high divorce rates, low levels of trust and low social cohesion, high unemployment, poverty and high crime rates. It has been suggested by others that teenage motherhood is a choice that women make when they feel they have no other prospects for achieving the social credentials of adulthood, such as a stable intimate relationship or rewarding employment. Sociologist Kristin Luca claims that it is the discouraged among the disadvantaged who become teenage mothers. But it is important to remember that it isn't only poor young women who become teenage mothers. Like all the problems we have looked at, inequality in teenage birth rates runs right across society. In Figure 9.1, we show the percentage of young British women who become teenage mothers in relation to household income. Each year, almost 5% of teenagers living in the poorest quarter of homes have a first baby, four times the rate in the richest quarter. But even in the second richest quarter of households, the rate is double that of the richest quarter, 2.4% and 1.2%. Similar patterns are seen in the United States. Although most of these births are to older teenagers aged 18 to 19 years, the pattern is evident and even stronger for the 15 to 17 year olds. Figure 9.2 shows that the international teenage birth rates provided by UNICEF are related to income inequality, and Figure 9.3 shows the same relationship for the 50 states of the USA using teen pregnancy rates from the U.S. National Vital Statistics System and the Allen Guttmacher Institute. There is a strong tendency for more unequal countries and more unequal states to have higher teenage birth rates, much too strong to be attributable to chance. The UNICEF report on teenage births showed that at least one and a quarter million teenagers become pregnant each year in the rich OECD countries, and about three quarters of a million go on to become teenage mothers. The differences in teen birth rates between countries are striking. The USA and UK top the charts. At the top of the league in our usual group of rich countries, the USA has a teenage birth rate of 52.1 per 1,000 women aged 15 to 19, more than four times the EU average and more than ten times higher than that of Japan, which has a rate of 4.6. Rachel Gold and colleagues have studied income inequality and teenage births in the USA and shown that teen birth rates are highest in the most unequal as well as the most relatively deprived counties. She also reported that the effect of inequality was strongest for the youngest mothers, those aged 15 to 17 years. For the U.S. states, we show data for live births and abortions combined. There are substantial differences in pregnancy rates between U.S. states. Mississippi has a rate close to twice that of Utah. We might expect patterns of conceptions, abortions and births to be influenced by factors such as religion and ethnicity. We'd expect predominantly Catholic countries to have high rates of teenage births because of low rates of abortion. But while predominantly Catholic Portugal and Ireland have high rates that would indeed fit this alternative explanation, Italy and Spain have unexpectedly low rates, although they are also predominantly Catholic. Within countries, different ethnic groups can have different cultures and values around sexuality, contraception, abortion, early marriage, and women's roles in society. In the USA, for example, Hispanic and African-American girls are almost twice as likely to be teenage mothers as white girls, and in the UK, similarly, comparatively high rates are seen in the Bangladeshi and Caribbean communities. But because these communities are minority populations, these differences don't actually have much impact on the ranking of countries and states by teenage pregnancy or birth rates, and so don't affect our interpretation of the link with inequality. But hidden within the simple relationships revealed in figures 9.2 and 9.3 are the real-life complexities of what it means to be a teenage mother in any particular country. For example, in Japan, Greece and Italy, more than half of the teenagers giving birth are married, 
In fact, in Japan, 86% of teen mothers are married, whereas in the USA, the UK and New Zealand, less than a quarter of these mothers are married. So not only do these latter countries have higher overall rates of teen births, but those births are more likely to be associated with the broad range of health and social problems that we think of as typical consequences of early motherhood, problems that affect both the mother and the child. Within the USA, Hispanic teenage mothers are more likely to be married than those from other ethnic groups, but they are also more likely to be poor. The same is true for Bangladeshis in the UK. So what do we know about who becomes a teenage mother that can help us understand this particular effect of inequality? The Fast Lane to Adulthood Interestingly, there is not much of a connection between teenage birth rates and birth rates for women of all ages in rich countries. The most unequal countries, the US, UK, New Zealand and Portugal, have much higher teenage birth rates relative to older women's birth rates than the more equal countries, such as Japan, Sweden, Norway and Finland, which have teenage birth rates that are lower relative to the rates of birth of older women. So whatever drives teenage birth rates up in more unequal countries is unconnected with the factors driving overall fertility. Unequal societies affect teenage childbearing in particular. A report from the Roundtree Foundation called Young People's Changing Routes to Independence, which compares how children born in 1958 and 1970 grew up, describes a widening gap between those on the fast and slow lanes to adulthood. In the slow lane, young people born into families in the higher socioeconomic classes spend a long time in education and career training, putting off marriage and childbearing until they are established as successful adults. For young people on the fast track, truncated education often leads them into a disjointed pattern of unemployment, low-paid work and training schemes, rather than an ordered, upward career trajectory. As sociologists Hilary Graham and Elizabeth McDermott point out, teenage motherhood is a pathway through which women become excluded from the activities and connections of the wider society, and a way in which generations become trapped by inequality. But as well as the constraints that relative poverty imposes on life chances for young people, there seem to be additional reasons why teenage motherhood is sensitive to degrees of inequality in society. Early maturity and absent fathers The first of these additional reasons was touched on in Chapter 8, where we discussed the impact of inequality on family relationships and stress in early life. Experiences in early childhood may be just as relevant to teenage motherhood as the educational and economic opportunities available to adolescents. In 1991, psychologist Jay Belsky at the University of London and his colleagues proposed a theory based on evolutionary psychology in which experiences in early childhood would lead individuals towards either a quantity or a quality reproductive strategy, depending on how stressful their early experiences had been. They suggested that people who learned while growing up to perceive others as untrustworthy, relationships as opportunistic and self-serving, and resources as scarce and or unpredictable, would reach biological maturity earlier, be sexually active earlier, be more likely to form short-term relationships, and make less investment in parenting. In contrast, people who grow up learning to perceive others as trustworthy, relationships as enduring and mutually rewarding, and resources more or less constantly available, would mature later, defer sexual activity, be better at forming long-term relationships, and invest more heavily in their children's development. In the world in which humans evolved, these different strategies make sense. If you can't rely on your mate or other people, and you can't rely on resources, then it may once have made sense to get started early and have lots of children, at least some will survive. But if you can trust your partner and family to be committed to you and to provide for you, it makes sense to have fewer children and to devote more attention and resources to each one. Rachel Gold and colleagues found that the relationship between inequality and teenage birth rates in the USA might be acting through the impact of inequality on social capital, which we discussed in Chapter 4. 
Among U.S. states, that is, those with lower levels of social cohesion, civic engagement, and mutual trust, exactly the conditions which might favor a quantity strategy, teenage birth rates are higher. Several studies have also shown that early conflict and the absence of a father do predict earlier maturation. Girls in such a situation become physically mature and start their periods earlier than girls who grow up without those sources of stress. And reaching puberty earlier increases the likelihood of girls becoming sexually active at an early age and of teenage motherhood. Father absence may be particularly important for teenage pregnancy. In a study of two large samples in the USA and New Zealand, psychologist Bruce Ellis and his colleagues followed girls from early childhood through to adulthood. In both countries, the longer a father was absent from the family, the more likely it was that his daughter would have sex at a young age and become a teenage mother, and this strong effect could not be explained away by behavioral problems of the girls, by family stress, parenting style, socioeconomic status, or by differences in the neighborhoods in which the girls grew up. So there may be deep-seated adaptive processes which lead from more stressful and unequal societies, perhaps particularly from low social status, to higher teenage birth rates. Unfortunately, while we can obtain international data on single-parent households, being a single parent means very different things in different countries, and there are no international data that tell us how many fathers are absent from their children's lives. What about the dads? Throughout this chapter, we've been discussing the problem of teenage parenting exclusively in terms of teenage mothers, but what about the fathers? Let's return to the story of the three sisters. The father of the 12-year-old girl's baby left her shortly after his son was born. The boy, named by the middle sister as the father of her little girl, denied having sex with her and demanded a paternity test and the 38-year-old father of the oldest sister's baby already had at least four other children. Sociologists Graham and McDermott discuss what has been learned from studies where researchers talk at length to young women about their experiences. What they show is that these sisters' experiences with their baby's fathers are typical. Motherhood is a way in which young women in deprived circumstances join adult social networks, networks which usually include their own mothers and other relatives, and these supportive networks help them transcend the social stigma of being a teenage mother. According to Graham and McDermott, young women prioritize their relationships with the babies over their often difficult relationships with the baby's fathers because they feel this relationship is a more certain source of intimacy than the heterosexual relationships they had experienced. Young men living in areas of high unemployment and low wages often can't offer much in the way of stability or support. In communities with high levels of teenage motherhood, young men are themselves trying to cope with the many difficulties that inequality inflicts on their lives, and young fatherhood adds to those stresses. 10. Violence. Gaining Respect. Quote, where justice is denied, where poverty is enforced, where ignorance prevails, and where any one class is made to feel that society is in an organized conspiracy to oppress, rob, and degrade them, neither persons nor property will be safe. Unquote. Frederick Douglass, Speech on the 24th Anniversary of Emancipation, Washington, D.C., 1886. As we began to write this chapter, violence was in the headlines on both sides of the Atlantic. In the USA, an 18-year-old man with a shotgun entered a shopping mall in Salt Lake City, Utah, killing five people and wounding four others, apparently at random, before being shot dead by police. In the UK, there was a wave of killings in South London, including the murder of three teenage boys in less than a fortnight. But perhaps the story that best illustrates what this chapter is about occurred in March 2006 in a quiet suburb of Cincinnati, Ohio. Charles Martin, a 66-year-old, telephoned the emergency services. I just killed a kid, he told the operator. I shot him with a goddamn 410 shotgun twice. Mr. Martin had shot his 15-year-old neighbor. The boy's crime? 
he had run across Mr. Martin's lawn. Kid's just been giving me a bunch of shit, making the other kids harass me and my place. Violence is a real worry in many people's lives. In the most recent British crime surveys, 35% of people said they were very worried or fairly worried about being a victim of mugging, 33% worried about physical attack, 24% worried about rape, and 13% worried about racially motivated violence. More than a quarter of the people who responded said they were worried about being insulted or pestered in public. Surveys in America and Australia report similar findings. In fact, fear of crime and violence may be as big a problem as the actual level of violence. Very few people are victims of violent crime, but fear of violence affects the quality of life of many more. Fear of violence disproportionately affects the vulnerable, the poor, women and minority groups. In many places, women feel nervous going out at night or coming home late. Old people double-lock their doors and won't open them to strangers. These are important infringements of basic human freedoms. People's fears of crime, violence, and antisocial behavior don't always match up with rates and trends in crime and violence. A recent downswing in homicide rates in America, which has now ended, was not matched by a reduction in people's fear of violence. We will return to recent trends later. First, let's turn our attention to differences in rates of actual violence between different societies and look at some of the similarities and the differences between them. In some ways, patterns of violence are remarkably consistent across time and space. In different places and at different times, violent acts are overwhelmingly perpetrated by men, and most of those men are in their teens or early twenties. In her book, The Ant and the Peacock, philosopher and evolutionary psychologist Helena Cronin shows how closely correlated the age and sex characteristics of murderers are in different places. We reproduce her graph showing murder rates comparing Chicago with England and Wales, figure 10.1. The age of the perpetrator is shown along the bottom. Up the side is the murder rate, and there are separate lines for men and women. It is immediately apparent that murder rates peak in the late teens and early twenties for men, and that rates for women are much lower at all ages. The age and sex distribution is astonishingly similar both in Chicago and in England and Wales. However, what is less obvious is that the scales on the left and right-hand sides of the graph are very different. On the left-hand side of the graph, the scale shows homicide rates per million people in England and Wales, going from 0 to 30. On the right-hand side, the scale shows homicide rates in Chicago, and here the scale runs from 0 to 900 murders per million. Despite the striking similarities in the patterns of age and sex distribution, there is something fundamentally different in these places. The city of Chicago had a murder rate 30 times higher than the rate in England and Wales. On top of the biological similarities, there are huge environmental differences. Violent crimes are almost unknown in some societies. In the USA, a child is killed by a gun every three hours. Despite having a much lower rate than the USA, the UK is a violent society compared to many other countries. Over a million violent crimes were recorded in 2005 to 2006. And within any society, while it is generally young men who are violent, most young men are not. Just as it is the discouraged and disadvantaged among young women who become teenage mothers, it is poor young men from disadvantaged neighborhoods who are most likely to be both victims and perpetrators of violence. Why? If you ain't got pride, you got nothing. James Gilligan is a psychiatrist at Harvard Medical School where he directs the Center for the Study of Violence and has worked on violence prevention for more than 30 years. He was in charge of mental health services for the Massachusetts prison system for many years, and for most of his years as a clinical psychiatrist, he worked with the most violent of offenders in prisons and prison mental hospitals. In his books Violence and Preventing Violence, he argues that acts of violence are attempts to ward off or eliminate the feeling of shame and humiliation, a feeling that is painful and can even be intolerable and overwhelming, 
and replace it with its opposite, the feeling of pride. Time after time, when talking to men who had committed violent offences, he discovered that the triggers to violence had involved threats, or perceived threats, to pride, acts that instigated feelings of humiliation or shame. Sometimes the incidents that led to violence seemed incredibly trivial, but they all evoked shame. A young neighbour walking disrespectfully across your immaculate lawn, the popular kids in the school harassing you and calling you a faggot, being fired from your job, your woman leaving you for another man, someone looking at you funny. Gilligan goes so far as to say that he has yet to see a serious act of violence that was not provoked by the experience of feeling shamed and humiliated, and that did not represent the attempt to undo this loss of face. And we can all recognize these feelings, even if we would never go so far as to act on them. We recognize the stomach-clenching feelings of shame and embarrassment, the mortification that we feel burning us up when we make ourselves look foolish in the eyes of others. We know how important it is to feel liked, respected, and valued. But if all of us feel these things, why is it predominantly among young men that those feelings escalate into violent acts? Here, the work of evolutionary psychologists Margot Wilson and Martin Daly helps to make sense of these patterns of violence. In their 1988 book Homicide, and a wealth of books, chapters, and articles since, they use statistical, anthropological, and historical data to show how young men have strong incentives to achieve and maintain as high a social status as they can, because their success in sexual competition depends on status. While looks and physical attractiveness are more important for women, it is status that matters most for sexual success among men. Psychologist David Buss found that women value the financial status of prospective partners roughly twice as much as men do. So while women try to enhance their sexual attractiveness with clothes and makeup, men compete for status. This explains not only why feeling put down, disrespected, and humiliated are the most common trigger for violence, it also explains why most violence is between men. Men have more to win or lose from having or failing to gain status. Reckless, even violent, behavior comes from young men at the bottom of society, deprived of all the markers of status, who must struggle to maintain face and what little status they have, often reacting explosively when it is threatened. But while it seems clear that the propensity for violence among young men lies partially in evolved psychological adaptations related to sexual competition, most men are not violent. So what factors explain why some societies seem better than others at preventing or controlling these impulses to violence? Inequality is structural violence. The simple answer is that increased inequality ups the stakes in the competition for status. Status matters even more. The impact of inequality on violence is even better established and accepted than the other effects of inequality that we discuss in this book. In this chapter we show relationships between violence and inequality for the same countries and the same time period as we use in other chapters. Many similar graphs have been published by other researchers for other time periods or sets of countries, including one covering more than 50 countries between 1970 and 1994 from researchers at the World Bank. A large body of evidence shows a clear relationship between greater inequality and higher homicide rates. As early as 1993, criminologists Shea and Pugh wrote a review which included 35 analyses of income inequality and violent crime. All but one found a positive link between the two. As inequality increased, so did violent crime. Homicides and assaults were most closely associated with income inequality, and robbery and rape less so. We have found the same relationships when looking at more recently published studies. Homicides are more common in the more unequal areas in cities ranging from Manhattan to Rio de Janeiro and in the more unequal American states and cities and Canadian provinces. Figure 10.2 shows that international homicide rates from the United Nations surveys on crime trends and the operations of criminal justice systems are related to income inequality, 
and figure 10.3 shows the same relationship for the USA, using homicide rates from the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The differences between some countries in the first graph are very large. The USA is once again at the top of the league table of the rich countries. Its murder rate is 64 per million, more than four times higher than the UK, 15 per million, and more than 12 times higher than Japan, which has a rate of only 5.2 per million. Two countries take rather unusual positions in this graph, compared to where they sit in many of our other chapters. Singapore has a much lower homicide rate than we might expect, and Finland has a higher rate. Interestingly, although international relationships between gun ownership and violent crime are complicated, for instance, gun ownership is linked to murders involving female victims but not male victims, in the United Nations International Study on Firearm Regulation, Finland had the highest proportion of households with guns, and Singapore had the lowest rate of gun ownership. Despite these exceptions, the trend for more unequal countries to have higher homicide rates is well established. In the USA, although no data were available for Wyoming, the relationship between inequality and homicides is still significant, and the differences between states are almost as great as the differences between countries. Louisiana has a murder rate of 107 per million, more than seven times higher than that of New Hampshire and Iowa, which are bottom of the league table with murder rates of 15 per million. The homicide rate in Alaska is much higher than we would expect, given its relatively low inequality, and rates in New York, Connecticut, and Massachusetts are lower. In the United States, two out of every three murders are committed with guns, and homicide rates are higher in states where more people own guns. Among the states on our graph, Alaska has the highest rate of gun ownership of all, and New York, Connecticut, and Massachusetts are among the lowest. If we allow for gun ownership, we find a slightly stronger relationship between inequality and homicides. Havens in a Heartless World We have already seen some features of more unequal societies that help to tie violence to inequality. Family life counts, schools and neighborhoods are important, and status competition matters. In Chapter 8, we mentioned a study which found that divorce rates are higher in more unequal American counties. In his book Life Without Father, sociologist David Popeno describes how 60% of America's rapists, 72% of juvenile murderers, and 70% of long-term prisoners grew up in fatherless homes. The effect of fatherlessness on delinquency and violence is only partly explained by these families being poorer. Why do fathers matter so much? One researcher has described the behavior of boys and young men who grew up without fathers as hypermasculine, with boys engaging in rigidly overcompensatory masculine behaviors, crimes against property and people, aggression and exploitation, and short-term sexual conquests. This could be seen as the male version of the quantity versus quality strategy in human relationships that we described in relation to teenage mothers in Chapter 9. The absence of a father may predispose some boys to a different reproductive strategy, shifting the balance away from long-term relationships and putting more emphasis on status competition. Fathers can, of course, act as positive role models for their sons. Fathers can teach boys, just by being present in the family, the positive aspects of manhood, how to relate to the opposite sex, how to be a responsible adult, how to be independent and assertive, yet included with and connected to other people. Particularly important is the way in which fathers can provide authority and discipline for teenage boys. Without that security, young men are more influenced by their peers and more likely to engage in the kinds of antisocial behavior so often seen when groups of young men get together. But fathers can also be negative role models. One study found that although children had more behavioral problems the less time they had lived with their fathers, this was not true when the fathers themselves had behavioral problems. If the fathers engaged in antisocial behavior, then their children were at higher risk when they spent more time living with them. Perhaps most importantly, fathers love their children in a way that studies show step-parents do not. 
This is not, of course, to say that most stepfathers and other men don't lovingly raise other men's children, but on average, children living with their biological fathers are less likely to be abused, less likely to be delinquent, less likely to drop out of school, less likely to be emotionally neglected. Psychiatrist Gilligan says of the violent men he worked with, quote, They had been subjected to a degree of child abuse that was off the scale of anything I had previously thought of describing with that term. Many had been beaten nearly to death, raped repeatedly or prostituted, or neglected to a life-threatening degree by parents too disabled to care for their child. And of those who had not experienced these extremes of physical abuse or neglect, my colleagues and I found that they had experienced a degree of emotional abuse that had been just as damaging, in which they served as the scapegoat for whatever feelings of shame and humiliation their parents had suffered and then attempted to rid themselves of by transferring them onto their child, by subjecting him to systematic and chronic shaming and humiliation, taunting and ridicule." Unquote. The increased family breakdown and family stress in unequal societies leads to intergenerational cycles of violence, just as much as intergenerational cycles of teenage motherhood. Of course, it isn't just the family environment that can breed shame, humiliation and violence. Children experience things in their schools and in their neighborhoods that influence the probability that they will turn to violence when their status is threatened. The American high school massacres have shown us the significance of bullying as a trigger to violence. In UNICEF's 2007 report on child well-being in rich countries, there are measures of how often young people in different countries were involved in physical fighting, had been the victim of bullying, or found their peers were not kind and helpful. We combined these three measures into an index of children's experiences of conflict and found that it was significantly correlated with income inequality, as shown in Figure 10.4. In more unequal societies, children experienced more bullying, fights and conflict, and there is no better predictor of later violence than childhood violence. Environmental influences on rates of violence have been recognized for a long time. In the 1940s, Sociologists of the Chicago School described how some neighborhoods had persistent reputations for violence over the years. Different populations moved in and out, but the same poor neighborhoods remained dangerous whoever was living in them. In Chicago, neighborhoods are often identified with a particular ethnic group, so a neighborhood which might once have been an enclave of Irish immigrants and their descendants later becomes a Polish community and later still a Latino neighborhood. What the Chicago school psychologists drew attention to was the persistent effect of deprivation and poverty in poor neighborhoods on whoever lived there. In neighborhoods where people can't trust one another, where there are high levels of fear and groups of youths hanging around on street corners, neighbors won't intervene for the common good. They feel helpless in the face of public disturbance, drug dealing, prostitution, graffiti and litter. Sociologist Robert Sampson and colleagues at Harvard University have shown that violent crime rates are lower in cohesive neighborhoods where residents have close ties with one another and are willing to act for the common good, even taking into account factors such as poverty, prior violence, the concentration of immigrants, and residential stability. In the USA, Poor neighborhoods have become ghettos, ring-fenced and neglected by the better-off who move out. Although neighbors in areas with low levels of trust, see Chapter 4, may feel less inclined to intervene for the common good, they seem to be more pugnacious. In Bowling Alone, sociologist Robert Putnam linked a measure of aggression to levels of social capital in U.S. states. In a survey, people were asked to say whether they agreed or disagreed with the sentence, I'd do better than average in a fistfight. Putnam says citizens in states with low social capital are readier for a fight, perhaps because they need to be, and they are predisposed to mayhem. When we analyze this measure of pugnacity in relation to inequality within states, we find just as strong a relation as Putnam showed with social capital, figure 10.5. So violence is most often a response to disrespect, humiliation and loss of face, and is usually a male response to these triggers. Even within the most violent of societies, 
Most people don't react violently to these triggers because they have ways of achieving and maintaining their self-respect and sense of status in other ways. They might have more of the trappings of status, a good education, nice houses and cars, good jobs, new clothes. They may have family, friends and colleagues who esteem them, or qualifications they are proud of, or skills that are valued and valuable, or education that gives them status and hope for the future. As a result, although everybody experiences disrespect and humiliation at times, they don't all become violent. We all experience loss of face, but we don't turn round and shoot somebody. In more unequal societies, more people lack these protections and buffers. Shame and humiliation become more sensitive issues in more hierarchical societies. Status becomes more important, status competition increases, and more people are deprived of access to markers of status and social success. And if your source of pride is your immaculate lawn, you're going to be more than a bit annoyed when that pride gets trampled on. Peaks and Troughs Homicide rates in America, after rising for decades, peaked in the early 1990s, then fell to their lowest level in the early 2000s. In 2005, they started to rise again. Similarly, after peaking in the early 1990s, teenage pregnancy and birth rates began to fall in America, and the decline was particularly steep for African Americans. But in 2006, the teenage birth rate also started to rise again, and the biggest reversal was for African American women. Some people have tried to explain the decline in violence by pointing to changes in policing or drug use or access to guns, or even the missing cohort of young men who were not born because of increased access to abortion. Explanations for the fall in teenage birth rates focused on changes in the number of teenagers who are sexually active and increasing contraceptive use. But what influences whether or not young people use drugs, buy guns, have sex or use contraception? Why are homicides and teenage births now rising again? And how do these trends match up with changes in inequality? Why have homicides and teenage births moved in parallel? To examine this in more detail, we need data on recent short-term fluctuations in overall income inequality in the USA. The best data come from a collaborative team of researchers from the USA, China and the UK who have produced a series of annual estimates. These show inequality rising through the 1980s to a peak in the early 1990s. The following decade saw an overall decline in inequality, with an upturn since 2000. So there is a reasonable match between recent trends in homicides, teenage births and inequality rising through the early 1990s and declining for a decade or so with a very recent upturn. Although violence and teenage births are complex issues and rates in each can respond to lots of other influences, the downward trends through the 1990s were consistent with improvements in the relative incomes of people at the very bottom of the income distribution. The distribution of income can be more stretched out over some parts of its range than others. A society may get more unequal because the poor are getting left further behind the middle or because the rich are pulling further ahead. And who suffers from low social status may also vary from one society to another. Among societies with the same overall level of inequality, in one it may be the elderly who are most deprived relative to the rest of society, in another it may be ethnic minority groups. From the early 1990s in America, there was a particularly dramatic decline in relative poverty and unemployment for young people at the bottom of the social hierarchy. Although the rich continued to pull further away from the bulk of the population, from the early 1990s the relative position of the very poorest Americans began to improve. As violence and teenage births are so closely connected to relative deprivation and concentrated in the poorest areas, it is what happens at the very bottom that matters most, hence the trends in violence and teenage births. These trends during the 1990s contrast with what had been happening previously. The decades leading up to the 1990s saw a long sustained deterioration in opportunities and status for young people at the bottom of both American and British society. In the USA, from about 1970 through the early 1990s, 
the earning position of young men declined, and employment prospects for young people who dropped out of high school or who completed high school but didn't go on to college worsened, and violence and teenage births increased. In a recent study, demographer Cynthia Colon and her colleagues showed that falling levels of unemployment during the 1990s explained 85% of the decline in rates of first births to 18- to 19-year-old African Americans. This was the group experiencing the biggest drop in teen births. Welfare reform and changes in the availability of abortion, in contrast, appeared to have had little impact. In the UK, the impact of the economic recession and widening income differences during the 1980s can also be traced in the homicide rate. As health geographer Danny Dorling pointed out with respect to these trends, quote, There is no natural level of murder. For murder rates to rise in particular places, people have to be made to feel more worthless. Then there are more fights, more brawls, more scuffles, more bottles and more knives, and more young men die. These are the same young men who saw many of their counterparts, brought up in better circumstances and in different parts of Britain, gain good work or university education or both, and become richer than any similarly sized cohort of such young ages in British history." Unquote. In summary, we can see that the association between inequality and violence is strong and consistent. It's been demonstrated in many different time periods and settings. Recent evidence of the close correlation between ups and downs in inequality and violence show that if inequality is lessened, levels of violence also decline, and the evolutionary importance of shame and humiliation provides a plausible explanation of why more unequal societies suffer more violence. 11. Imprisonment and Punishment Quote, the degree of civilization in a society can be judged by entering its prisons, unquote. Fyodor Dostoevsky, The House of the Dead. In the USA, prison populations have been increasing steadily since the early 1970s. In 1978, there were over 450,000 people in jail. By 2005, there were over 2 million. The numbers had quadrupled. In the UK, the numbers have doubled since 1990, climbing from around 46,000 to 80,000 in 2007. In fact, in February 2007, the UK's jails were so full that the Home Secretary wrote to judges asking them to send only the most serious criminals to prison. This contrasts sharply with what has been happening in some other rich countries. Through the 1990s, the prison population was stable in Sweden and declined in Finland. It rose by only 8% in Denmark, 9% in Japan. More recently, rates have been falling in Ireland, Austria, France and Germany. Crime or punishment The number of people locked up in prison is influenced by three things. The rate at which crimes are actually committed, the tendency to send convicted criminals to prison for particular crimes, and the lengths of prison sentences. Changes in any of these three can lead to changes in the proportion of the population in prison at any point in time. We've already described the tendency for violent crimes to be more common in more unequal societies in Chapter 10. What has been happening to crime rates in the USA and UK as rates of imprisonment have skyrocketed? Criminologists Alfred Blumstein and Alan Beck have examined the growth in the U.S. prison population. Only 12% of the growth in state prisoners between 1980 and 1996 could be put down to increases in criminal offending, dominated by a rise in drug-related crime. The other 88% of increased imprisonment was due to the increasing likelihood that convicted criminals were sent to prison rather than being given non-custodial sentences and to the increased length of prison sentences. In federal prisons, longer prison sentences are the main reason for the rise in number of prisoners. Three strikes laws, minimum mandatory sentences and truth in sentencing laws, i.e. no remission, mean that some convicted criminals are receiving long sentences for minor crimes. In California in 2004, there were 360 people serving life sentences for shoplifting. <laughs>
In the UK, prison numbers have also grown because of longer sentences and the increased use of custodial sentences for offences that a few years ago would have been punished with a fine or community sentence. About 40 prison sentences for shoplifting are handed out every day in the UK. Crime rates in the UK were falling as inexorably as imprisonment rates were rising. The prison system in the Netherlands has been described by criminologist David Downs, Professor Emeritus of Social Administration at the London School of Economics. He describes how two-thirds of the difference between the low rate of imprisonment in the Netherlands and the much higher rate in the UK is due to the different use of custodial sentences and the length of those sentences rather than differences in rates of crime. Comparing different countries, Mark Maurer of the Sentencing Project shows that in the USA people are sent to prison more often and for longer for property and drug crimes than they are in Canada, West Germany and England and Wales. For example, in the USA burglars received average sentences of 16 months, whereas in Canada the average sentence was 5 months. And variations in crime rates didn't explain more than a small amount of the variation in rates of imprisonment when researchers looked at Australia, New Zealand and a number of European countries. If crime rates can't explain different rates of imprisonment, can inequality do better? Imprisonment and Inequality we used statistics on the proportion of the population imprisoned in different countries from the United Nations Survey on Crime Trends and the Operations of Criminal Justice Systems. Figure 11.1 .1 shows on a log scale that more unequal countries have higher rates of imprisonment than more equal countries. In the USA, there are 576 people in prison per 100,000, which is more than four and a half times higher than the UK at 124 per 100,000, and more than 14 times higher than Japan, which has the lowest rate at 40 per 100,000. Even if the USA and Singapore are excluded as outliers, the relationship is robust among the remaining countries. For the 50 states of the USA, figures for imprisonment in 1997-8 come from the U.S. Department of Justice Bureau of Justice Statistics. As figure 11.2 shows, there is again a strong relationship between imprisonment and inequality and big differences between states. Louisiana imprisons people at more than six times the rate of Minnesota. The other thing to notice on this graph is that states are shown using two different symbols. The circles represent states that have abolished the death penalty. Diamonds are states which have retained it. As we pointed out in Chapter 2, these relationships with inequality occur for problems which have steep social gradients within societies. There is a strong social gradient in imprisonment, with people of lower class, income and education much more likely to be sent to prison than people higher up the social scale. The rarity of middle-class people being imprisoned is highlighted by the fact that two sociologists at California State Polytechnic thought it worthwhile to publish a research paper describing a middle-class inmate's adaptation to prison life. Racial and ethnic disparities in rates of imprisonment are one way of showing the inequalities in risk of being imprisoned. In America, the racial gap can be measured as the ratio between imprisonment rates for whites and blacks. Hawaii is the only state where the risk of being imprisoned doesn't seem to differ much by race. There, the risk of being imprisoned if you are black is 1.34 times as high as if you are white. In every other state of the Union, ratios are greater than 2. The ratio is 6.04 for the USA as a whole and rises to 13.15 for New Jersey. There is a similar picture in the UK, where members of ethnic minorities are much more likely to end up in prison. Are these ethnic equalities a result of ethnic disparities in rates of crimes committed? Research on young Americans suggests not. 25% of white youths in America have committed one violent offence by age 17, compared to 36% of African Americans. Ethnic rates of property crime are the same, and African American youth commit fewer drug crimes but African-American youth are overwhelmingly more likely to be arrested, to be detained, to be charged, to be charged as if an adult, and to be imprisoned.
The same pattern is true for African-American and Hispanic adults, who are treated more harshly than whites at every stage of judicial proceedings. Facing the same charges, white defendants are far more likely to have the charges against them reduced or to be offered diversion, a deferment or suspension of prosecution if the offender agrees to certain conditions, such as completing a drug rehabilitation program. Degrees of Civilization Prison data shows us that more unequal societies are more punitive. There are other indicators of this in the ways that offenders are treated in different penal systems. First, as figure 11.2 shows, more unequal U.S. states are more likely to retain the death penalty. Second, how prisoners are treated seems to differ. Discussing the Netherlands, David Downs describes how a group of criminal lawyers, criminologists and psychiatrists came together to influence the prison system. They believed that, quote, the offender must be treated as a thinking and feeling fellow human being, capable of responding to insights offered in the course of a dialogue with therapeutic agents, unquote. This philosophy has, he says, resulted in a prison system that emphasizes treatment and rehabilitation. It allows home leave and interruptions to sentences, as well as extensive use of parole and pardons. Prisoners are housed in single cells, relations among prisoners and between prisoners and staff are good, and programs for education, training and recreation are considered a model of best practice. Although the system has toughened up somewhat since the 1980s in response to rising crime, mostly a consequence of rising rates of drug trafficking and the use of the Netherlands as a base for international organized crime, it remains characteristically humane and decent. Japan is another country with a very low rate of imprisonment. Prison environments there have been described as havens of tranquility. The Japanese judicial system exercises remarkable flexibility in prosecution and criminal proceedings. Offenders who confess to their crimes and express regret and a desire to reform are generally trusted to do so by police, judges and the public at large. One criminologist writes that, quote, The vast majority of those prosecuted confess, display repentance, negotiate for their victim's pardon, and submit to the mercy of the authorities. In return, they are treated with extraordinary leniency." Unquote. Many custodial sentences are suspended, even for serious crimes that in other countries would lead to long mandatory sentences. Apparently, most prison inmates agree that their sentences are appropriate. Prisoners are housed in sleeping rooms holding up to eight people, and meals are taken in these small group settings. Prisoners work a 40-hour week and have access to training and recreational activities. Discipline is strict, with exact rules of conduct, but this seems to serve to maintain a calm atmosphere rather than provoke an aggressive reaction. Prison staff are expected to act as moral educators and lay counsellors as well as guards. The picture is far starker in the prison systems of the USA. The harshness of the U.S. prison systems at federal, state, and county levels has led to repeated condemnations by such bodies as Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and the United Nations Committee Against Torture. Their concerns relate to such practices as the incarceration of children in adult prisons, the treatment of the mentally ill and learning disabled, the prevalence of sexual assaults within prisons, the shackling of women inmates during childbirth, the use of electroshock devices to control prisoners, the use of prolonged solitary confinement, and the brutality and ill-treatment sometimes perpetrated by police and prison guards, particularly against ethnic minorities, migrants, and homosexuals. Eminent American criminologist John Irwin has spent time studying high-security prisons, county jails, and Solano State Prison in California, a medium security facility housing around 6,000 prisoners, where prisoners are crowded together with very limited access to recreational facilities or education, training, or substance abuse programs. He describes serious psychological harm done to prisoners and their difficulties in coping with the world outside when released across all security levels and types of institutions. In some prisons, inmates are denied recreational activities, including television and sport activities.
In others, prisoners have to pay for health care as well as room and board. Some have brought back prison stripe uniforms and chain gangs. America's toughest sheriff, Joe Arpaio, has become famous for his tent city county jail in the Arizona desert, where prisoners live under canvas despite temperatures that can rise to 130 degrees Fahrenheit and are fed on meals costing less than 10p, 20 cents, per head. America's development of the Supermax prison, facilities designed to create a permanent state of social isolation, has been condemned by the United Nations Committee on Torture. Sometimes freestanding, but sometimes constructed as prisons within prisons, these are facilities where prisoners are kept in solitary confinement for 23 hours out of every day. Inmates leave their cells only for solitary exercise or showers. Medical anthropologist Lorna Rhodes, who has worked in a supermax, describes prisoners' lives as characterized by lack of movement, stimulation, and social contact. Prisoners kept in such conditions often are or become mentally ill and are unprepared for eventual release. They have no meaningful work, get no training or education. Estimates vary, but as many as 40,000 people may be imprisoned under these conditions, and new supermax prisons continue to be built. There is, of course, considerable variation in prison regimes within the USA. A recent report by the Committee on Safety and Abuse in America's Prisons gives a comprehensive picture of the problems of the system and describes some of the more humane systems and practices. A healthcare initiative in Massachusetts provides continuity of care for prisoners within prison and in the community after release. Maryland has an exemplary program for screening inmates for mental illness. Vermont ensures that prisoners have access to low-cost telephone calls to maintain their contacts with the outside world. And in Minnesota, there is a high-security prison that emphasizes human contact, natural light, and sensory stimulation, regular exercise and the need to treat inmates with dignity and respect. If you look back at figure 11.2, you can see that most of these examples come from among the more equal U.S. states. Not only do the higher rates of imprisonment in more unequal societies seem to reflect more punitive sentencing rather than crime rates, but both the harshness of the prison systems and use of capital punishment point in the same direction. Does prison work? Perhaps a high rate of imprisonment and a harsh system for dealing with criminals would seem worthwhile if prison worked to deter crime and protect the public. Authors note, John Irwin writes that while imprisonment is generally believed to have four official purposes, retribution for crimes committed, deterrence, incapacitation of dangerous criminals, and the rehabilitation of criminals, In fact, three other purposes have shaped America's rates and conditions of imprisonment. These unofficial purposes are class control, the need to protect honest middle-class citizens from the dangerous criminal underclass, scapegoating, diverting attention away from more serious social problems, and here he singles out growing inequalities in wealth and income, and using the threat of the dangerous class for political gain. Instead, the consensus among experts worldwide seems to be that it doesn't work very well. Prison psychiatrist James Gilligan says that the most effective way to turn a non-violent person into a violent one is to send him to prison. In fact, imprisonment doesn't seem to work as well now as it used to in the U.S. Parole violation and repeat offending are an increasing factor in the growth of imprisonment rates. Between 1980 and 1996, prison admissions for parole violations rose from 18% to 35%. Long sentences seem to be less of a deterrent than higher conviction rates, and the longer someone is incarcerated, the harder it is for them to adapt to life outside. Gilligan says that, quote, The criminal justice and penal systems have been operating under a huge mistake, namely the belief that punishment will deter, prevent, or inhibit violence, when in fact it is the most powerful stimulant of violence that we have yet discovered." Some efforts to use punishment systems to deter crime are not just ineffective, they actually increase crime. In the UK, the introduction of antisocial behaviour orders, ASBOs, for delinquent youths has been controversial, partly because they can criminalise behaviour that is otherwise lawful, 
but also because the acquisition of an ASBO has come to be seen as a rite of passage and badge of honour among some young people. Although there seems to be a growing consensus among experts that prison doesn't work, it is difficult to find good comparable data on reoffending rates in different countries. If a country imprisons a smaller proportion of its citizens, these are more likely to be hardened criminals than those imprisoned under a harsher regime. So we might expect countries with lower overall rates of imprisonment to have higher rates of reoffending. In fact, there appears to be a trend towards higher rates of reoffending in more punitive systems. In the USA and UK, reoffending rates are generally reported to be between 60 and 65 percent, and lower rates in less harsh environments. Sweden and Japan are reported to have recidivism rates between 35 and 40 percent. Hardening attitudes. We've seen that imprisonment rates are not determined by crime rates so much as by differences in official attitudes towards punishment versus rehabilitation and reform. In societies with greater inequality, where the social distances between people are greater, where attitudes of us and them are more entrenched, and where lack of trust and fear of crime are rife, public and policy makers alike are more willing to imprison people and adopt punitive attitudes towards the criminal elements of society. More unequal societies are harsher, tougher places, and as prison is not particularly effective for either deterrence or rehabilitation, then a society must only be willing to maintain a high rate and high cost of imprisonment for reasons unrelated to effectiveness. Societies that imprison more people also spend less of their wealth on welfare for their citizens. This is true of the US states and also of OECD countries. Criminologists David Downs and Kirstein Hansen report that this phenomenon of penal expansion and welfare contraction has become more pronounced over the past couple of decades. In his book Crime and Punishment in America, published in 1998, Sociologist Elliot Curry points out that since 1984, the state of California built only one new college, but 21 new prisons. In more unequal societies, money is diverted away from positive spending on welfare, education, etc., into the criminal and judicial systems. Among our group of rich countries, there is a significant correlation between income inequality and the number of police and internal security officers per 100,000 people. Sweden employs 181 police per 100,000 people, while Portugal has 450. Our impression is that, in more equal countries and societies, Legal and judicial systems, prosecution procedures and sentencing, as well as penal systems, are developed in consultation with experts, criminologists, lawyers, prison psychiatrists and psychologists, etc., and so reflect both theoretical and evidence-based considerations of what works to deter crime and rehabilitate offenders. In contrast, more unequal countries and states seem to have developed legal frameworks and penal systems in response to media and political pressure, a desire to get tough on crime and be seen to be doing so, rather than on a considered reflection on what works and what doesn't. John Silverman, writing for the UK's Economic and Social Research Council, says that prisons are effective only as a means of answering a sustained media battering with an apparent show of force. In conclusion, Downs and Hansen deserve to be quoted in full. Quote, a growing fear of crime and loss of confidence in the criminal justice system among the population made the general public more favourable towards harsh criminal justice policies. Thus, in certain countries, in particular the United States and to a lesser extent the United Kingdom, Public demand for tougher and longer sentences has been met by public policy and election campaigns which have been fought and won on the grounds of the punitiveness of penal policy. In other countries, such as Sweden and Finland, where the government provides greater insulation against emotions generated by moral panic and long-term cycles of tolerance and intolerance, citizens have been less likely to call for and to support harsher penal policies and the government has resisted the urge to implement such plans." Unquote. 12. Social Mobility – Unequal Opportunities Quote, 
all the people like us are we, and everyone else is they, unquote. Rudyard Kipling, We and They. In some historical and modern societies, social mobility has been virtually impossible. Where social status is determined by religious or legal systems, such as the Hindu caste system, the feudal systems of medieval Europe, or slavery, there is little or no opportunity for people to move up or down the social ladder. But in modern market democracies, people can move up or down within their lifetime, intragenerational mobility, or offspring can move up and down relative to their parents, intergenerational mobility. The possibility of social mobility is what we mean when we talk about equality of opportunity, the idea that anybody, by their own merits and hard work, can achieve a better social or economic position for themselves and their family. Unlike greater equality itself, equality of opportunity is valued across the political spectrum, at least in theory. Even if they do nothing to actively promote social mobility, very few politicians would take a public stance against equal opportunity. So how mobile are our rich market democracies? It's not easy to measure social mobility in societies. Doing so requires longitudinal data, studies that track people over time to see where they started from and where they end up. One convenient way is to take income mobility as a measure of social mobility, to see how much people's incomes change over their lifetimes, or how much they earn in comparison to their parents. To measure intergenerational mobility, these longitudinal studies need to cover periods as much as 30 years in order for the offspring to establish their position in the income hierarchy. When we have income data for parents and offspring, Social mobility can be measured as the correlation between the two. If the correlation between parents' income and child's income is high, that means that rich parents tend to have children who are also rich, and poor parents tend to have children who stay poor. When the correlation is low, children's income is less influenced by whether their parents were rich or poor. These comparisons are not affected by the fact that average incomes are now higher than they used to be. Like father, like son? Comparable international data on our intergenerational social mobility are available for only a few of our rich countries. We take our figures from a study by economist Joe Blandon and colleagues at the London School of Economics. Using large representative longitudinal studies for eight countries, these researchers were able to calculate social mobility as the correlation between fathers' incomes when their sons were born and sons' incomes at age 30. Despite having data for only eight countries, the relationship between intergenerational social mobility and income inequality is very strong. Figure 12.1 shows that countries with bigger income differences tend to have much lower social mobility. In fact, far from enabling the ideology of the American dream, the USA has the lowest mobility rate among these eight countries. The UK also has low social mobility, West Germany comes in the middle, and Canada and the Scandinavian countries have much higher mobility. With data for so few countries, we need to be cautious, particularly as there are no data of this sort that allow us to estimate social mobility for each state and test the relationship with inequality independently in the USA. But other observations, looking at changes in social mobility over time, public spending on education, changes in geographical segregation, the work of sociologists on matters of taste and psychologists on displaced aggression, and so-called group density effects on health, lend plausibility to the picture we see in Figure 12.1. The first of these observations is that, after slowly increasing from 1950 to 1980, social mobility in the USA declined rapidly as income differences widened dramatically in the later part of the century. Figure 12.2 uses data from the State of Working America 2006-7 report. The height of each column shows the power of fathers' income to determine the income of their sons, so shorter bars indicate more social mobility. Fathers' incomes are less predictive of sons' incomes. Higher bars indicate less mobility. Rich fathers are more likely to have rich sons and poor fathers to have poor sons.
Data from the 1980s and 1990s show that about 36% of children whose parents were in the bottom fifth of the wealth distribution end up in that same bottom fifth themselves as adults, and among children whose parents were in the top fifth for wealth, 36% of them can be found in the same top fifth. Those at the top can maintain their wealth and status, those at the bottom find it difficult to climb up the income ladder, but there is more flexibility in the middle. Intergenerational social mobility has also been falling in Britain over the time period that income differences have widened. A second observation that supports our belief that greater income inequality reduces social mobility comes from data on spending on education. Education is generally thought of as the main engine of social mobility in modern democracies. People with more education earn more and have higher social status. We saw in Chapter 8 how inequality affects educational achievements and aspirations, but it's worth noting that among the eight countries for which we have information about social mobility, public expenditure on education, elementary-slash-primary and high-slash-secondary schools, is strongly linked to the degree of income equality. In Norway, the most equal of the eight, almost all, 97.8%, spending on school education is public expenditure. In contrast, in the USA, the least equal of this group of countries, only about two-thirds, 68.2% of the spending on school education is public money. This is likely to have a substantial impact on social differences in access to higher education. This is the end of the CD. The audiobook continues on the next CD. Moving upwards, moving out. A third type of evidence that may confirm the correlation between income inequality and social mobility is the way in which greater social distances become translated into greater geographical segregation between rich and poor in more unequal societies. As inequality has increased since the 1970s in the USA, so too has the geographical segregation of rich and poor. Political economist Paul Jargowski has analyzed data from the 1970, 1980 and 1990 U.S. Census and shown that the residential concentration of poverty increased over that period. Neighborhood concentration of poverty is a measure that tells us what proportion of poor people in a city live in high-poverty areas. Jargowski estimates that in 1970, about one in four poor blacks lived in high-poverty neighborhoods, but by 1990 that proportion had risen to one in three. Among whites, poverty concentration doubled during the two decades, while income differences were widening. When poverty concentration is high, poor people are not only coping with their own poverty, but also the consequences of the poverty of their neighbors. Between the 1990 and the 2000 census, Jargowski reports a decline in poverty concentration, particularly for black Americans in the inner cities, which goes along with the improvements in the relative position of the very poorest Americans, which we described at the end of Chapter 10. Even as poverty concentration has declined in the inner city, though, it has grown in the inner ring of suburbs, and with the recent economic downturn in America, Jargowski warns that the gains of the 1990s may have already been reversed. A similar pattern of segregation by poverty and wealth during a period of increasing income differences has been taking place in the UK. The rich are willing to pay to live separately from the poor, and residential segregation along economic lines increased throughout the 1980s and 1990s. The image of the sink estate provokes just as clear a picture of a deprived underclass as does the image of the ghetto and the barrio in the USA. Researchers on both sides of the Atlantic are clear that increased income inequality is responsible for increasing the segregation of rich and poor. The concentration of poor people in poor areas increases all kinds of stress, deprivation and difficulty, from increased commuting times for those who have to leave deprived communities to find work elsewhere, to increased risk of traffic accidents, worse schools, poor levels of services, exposure to gang violence, pollution, and so on. Sociologist William Julius Wilson, in his classic study of inner-city poverty, refers to poor people in poor neighborhoods as the truly disadvantaged. 
Two studies from the USA have shown that residential economic segregation increases people's risk of dying, and one showed that more unequal cities were also more economically segregated. These processes will of course feed back into further reductions in social mobility. Matters of taste and culture So social mobility is lower and geographical segregation greater in more unequal societies. It is as if greater inequality makes the social structure of society more rigid and movement up and down the social ladder more difficult. The work of French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu also helps us to understand how social mobility becomes more limited within more hierarchical societies. He describes how material differences between people, the amount of money and resources they have, become overlaid with cultural markers of social difference, which become matters of snobbery and prejudice. We all use matters of taste as marks of distinction and social class. We judge people by their accent, clothing, language, choice of reading matter, the television programs they watch, the food they eat, the sports they play, the music they prefer, and their appreciation, or lack of it, of art. Middle class and upper class people have the right accents, know how to behave in polite society, know that education can enhance their advantages. They pass all of this on to their children, so that they in turn will succeed in school and work, make good marriages, find high-paying jobs, etc. This is how elites become established and maintain their elite status. People can use markers of distinction and class, their good taste, to maintain their position, but throughout the social hierarchy, people also use discrimination and downward prejudice to prevent those below them from improving their status. Despite the modern ideology of equality of opportunity, these matters of taste and class still keep people in their place, stopping them from believing they can better their position and sapping their confidence if they try. The experiments on stereotype threat described in Chapter 8 show how strong the effects on performance can be. Bourdieu calls the actions by which the elite maintain their distinction symbolic violence. We might just as easily call them discrimination and snobbery. Although racial prejudice is widely condemned, class prejudice is, despite the similarities, rarely mentioned. These social systems of taste, which define what is highbrow and cultured and what is lowbrow or popular, constantly shift in content but are always with us. The examples that Bourdieu collected in the 1960s seem very dated now but illustrate the point. He found that different social class groups preferred different types of music. The lower social class groups preferred the catchy tune of the Blue Danube, while the upper classes expressed a preference for the more difficult, well-tempered clavier. The upper classes preferred abstract art and experimental novels, while the lower classes liked representational pictures and a good plot. But if everybody starts to enjoy Bach and Picasso and James Joyce, then upper class taste will shift to appreciate something new, Elitism is maintained by shifting the boundaries. What Bourdieu is describing is an economy of cultural goods, and inequalities in that economy affect people almost as profoundly as inequalities in income. In her book Watching the English, anthropologist Kate Fox describes the social class markers of the English in conversation, homes, cars, clothes, food and more, Joseph Epstein does the same for the USA in Snobbery, the American version. Both books are amusing as well as erudite, and it's difficult not to laugh at our own pretensions and the poor taste of others. In the UK, for example, you can tell if someone is working class, middle class or upper class by whether they call their evening meal tea, dinner or supper, by whether they call their mother ma'am, mum or mummy by whether they go out to a do, a function, or a party, and so on. Snobbery, says Epstein, is sitting in your BMW 740i and feeling quietly, assuredly better than the poor vulgarian who pulls up next to you at the stoplight in his garish Cadillac. It is the calm pleasure with which you greet the news that the son of the woman you have just been introduced to is majoring in photojournalism at Arizona State University 
while your own daughter is studying art history at Harvard. But snobbishness and taste turn out to be a zero-sum game. Epstein goes on to point out that another day at another stoplight, a Bentley will pull up next to your pathetic BMW, and you may be introduced to a woman who's studying classics at Oxford. The ways in which class and taste and snobbery work to constrain people's opportunities and well-being are in reality painful and pervasive. They are forms of discrimination and social exclusion. In their 1972 book The Hidden Injuries of Class, sociologists Richard Sennett and Jonathan Cobb describe the psychological damage done to working-class men in Boston who had come to view their failures to get on in the world as a result of their own inadequacies, resulting in feelings of hostility, resentment and shame. More recently, sociologist Simon Charlesworth, in an interview with a working-class man in Rotherham in the English Midlands, is told how ashamed the man feels encountering a middle-class woman. Even without anything being said between them, he is immediately filled with a sense of his inferiority, becomes self-conscious, and eventually hostile and angry. Quote, I went into the social, social security office, the other day. There were chairs and a space next to this stuck-up cow, you know, slim, attractive, middle class, and I didn't want to sit with her. You feel you shouldn't. I became all conscious of my weight. I felt overweight. I start sweating, I start bungling, shuffling. I just thought, no, I'm not going to sit there. I don't want to put her out. I don't want to feel that she's put out. You don't want to bother them. You know you insult them, the way they look at you like they're disgusted. They look at you like you're invading their area. You know, straight away you feel, I shouldn't be there. It makes you not want to go out. What it is, it's a form of violence. Right, it's like a barrier saying, listen, lowlife, don't even... Voice rises with pain and anger. Come near me. What the fuck are you doing in my space? We pay to get away from scum like you. It fucking stresses you. You get exhausted. It's everywhere. I mean, I clocked her, looked at her, like they clock us, right? And I thought, fuck me. I ain't even sitting there. She would be uncomfortable and it'll embarrass me. You know, voice rises in anger slash pain. Just sitting there. You know what I'm trying to say? It's like a common understanding. You know how they feel. You feel it. I'm telling you. They are fuck all. They've got nothing. But it's that air about them, you know. They've got the right body, the clothes and everything, the confidence, the attitude. Know what I mean? We, sadly, voice drops, ain't got it. We can't have it. We walk in like we've been beaten, dragging our feet when we're walking in. You feel like you want to hide. Unquote. The Bicycling Reaction Bigger differences in material wealth make status differences more important, and in more unequal societies the weight of downward prejudice is bound to be heavier. There is more social distance between the haves at the very top and the have-nots at the bottom. In effect, greater inequality increases downward social prejudices. We maintain social status by showing superiority to those below, those deprived of status try to regain it by taking it out on more vulnerable people below them. Two lines of doggerel capture these processes. The English say, The captain kicks the cabin boy, and the cabin boy kicks the cat, describing the downward flow of aggression and resentment, while a line from an American rhyme famously describes Boston as the place where the Lowells talk only to the Cabots, and the Cabots talk only to God invoking the snobbery and social climbing of people looking up to those above them. When people react to a provocation from someone with higher status by redirecting their aggression onto someone of lower status, psychologists label it displaced aggression. Examples include the man who is berated by his boss and comes home and shouts at his wife and children, the higher degree of aggression in workplaces where supervisors treat workers unfairly, the ways in which people in deprived communities react to an influx of foreign immigrants, and the ways in which prisoners who are bullied turn on others below them, particularly sex offenders, in the prison hierarchy. In his book The Hot House, which describes life inside a high-security prison in the U.S., 
Pete Early tells a story about a man in prison with a life sentence for murder. Bowles had been incarcerated for the first time at the age of 15 when he was sent to a juvenile reformatory. The day he arrived, an older, bigger boy came up to him. "'Hey, what size shoes do you wear?' the boy asked. "'Don't know,' said Bowles. "'Let me see one of them, will you?' the boy asked politely. Bowles sat down on the floor and removed a shoe. The older boy took off one of his own shoes and put on Bowles's. "'How about letting me see the other one?' "'I took off my other shoe and handed it to him,' Bowles remembered, "'and he puts it on and ties it and then walks over to this table "'and every boy in the place starts laughing at me. "'That's when I realized I am the butt of the joke.' Bowles grabbed a pool cue and attacked the boy, for which he received a week of hard labor. When a new boy arrived at the reformatory the following week, he too was confronted by a boy who demanded his shoes, only this time it was Bowles who was taking advantage of the new kid. It was my turn to dish it out, he recalled. I had earned that right. In the same book, Early tells almost exactly the same story again, only this time he describes a man's reaction to being sexually assaulted and sodomized on his first night in a county jail at the age of sixteen. Six years later, arrested in another town, he is put in a jail cell with a kid, probably seventeen or so, and you know what I did? I fucked him. Displaced aggression among non-human primates has been labelled the bicycling reaction. Primatologist Volker Sommer explains that the image being conjured up is of someone on a racing bicycle bowing to their superiors while kicking down on those beneath. He was describing how animals living in strict social hierarchies appease dominant animals and attack inferior ones. Psychologists Jim Sidanius and Felicia Prato have suggested that human group conflict and oppression, such as racism and sexism, stem from the way in which inequality gives rise to individual and institutional discrimination and the degree to which people are complicit or resistant to some social groups being dominant over others. In more unequal societies, more people are oriented towards dominance. In more egalitarian societies, more people are oriented towards inclusiveness and empathy. Our final piece of evidence that income inequality causes lower social mobility comes from research which helps to explain why stigmatized groups of people living in more unequal societies can feel more comfortable when separated from the people who look down on them. In a powerful illustration of how discrimination and prejudice damage people's well-being, research shows that the health of ethnic minority groups who live in areas with more people like themselves is sometimes better than that of their more affluent counterparts who live in areas with more of the dominant ethnic group. This is called a group density effect and was first shown in relation to mental illness. Studies in London, for example, have shown a higher incidence of schizophrenia among ethnic minorities living in neighbourhoods with fewer people like themselves, and the same has been shown for suicide and self-harm. More recently, studies in the United States have demonstrated the same effects for heart disease and low birth weight. Generally, living in a poorer area is associated with worse health. Members of ethnic minorities who live in areas where there are few like themselves tend to be more affluent and to live in better neighborhoods than those who live in areas with a higher concentration. So to find that these more ethnically isolated individuals are sometimes less healthy is surprising. The probable explanation is that through the eyes of the majority community, they become more aware of belonging to a low-status minority group and perhaps encounter more frequent prejudice and discrimination and have less support. That the psychological effects of stigma are sometimes strong enough to override the health benefits of material advantage tells us a lot about the power of inequality and brings us back to the importance of social status, social support and friendship and the influence of social anxiety and stigma discussed in Chapter 3. Bigger income differences seem to solidify the social structure and decrease the chances of upward mobility. Where there are greater inequalities of outcome, equal opportunity is a significantly more distant prospect. Part 3. A Better Society 13. Dysfunctional Societies 
Quote, no man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. Unquote. John Donne, Meditation 17. The last nine chapters have shown, among the rich developed countries and among the fifty states of the United States, that most of the important health and social problems of the rich world are more common in more unequal societies. In both settings, the relationships are too strong to be dismissed as chance findings. The importance of these relationships can scarcely be overestimated. First, the differences between more and less equal societies are large. Problems are anything from three times to ten times as common in the more unequal societies. Second, these differences are not differences between high and low risk groups within populations, which might apply only to a small proportion of the population or just to the poor. Rather, they are differences between the prevalence of different problems, which apply to whole populations. Dysfunctional Societies One of the points which emerge from chapters 4 through 12 is a tendency for some countries to do well on just about everything and others to do badly. You can predict a country's performance on one outcome from a knowledge of others. If, for instance, a country does badly on health, you can predict with some confidence that it will also imprison a large proportion of its population, have more teenage pregnancies, lower literacy scores, more obesity, worse mental health, and so on. Inequality seems to make countries socially dysfunctional across a wide range of outcomes. Internationally, at the healthy end of the distribution, we always seem to find the Scandinavian countries and Japan. At the opposite end, suffering high rates of most of the health and social problems are usually the USA, Portugal, and the UK. The same is true among the 50 states of the USA. Among those that tend to perform well across the board are New Hampshire, Minnesota, North Dakota, and Vermont and among those which do least well are Mississippi, Louisiana, and Alabama. Figure 13.1 summarizes our findings. It is an exact copy of Figure 2.2. It shows again the relationship between inequality and our combined index of health and social problems. This graph also shows that the relationship is not dependent on any particular group of countries, for instance those at either end of the distribution. Instead, it is robust across the range of inequality found in the developed market democracies. Even though we sometimes find less strong relationships among our analyses of the 50 U.S. states, in the international analyses, the USA as a whole is just where its inequality would lead us to expect. Though some countries' figures are presumably more accurate than others, it is clearly important that we do not cherry-pick the data, that is why we have used the same set of inequality data published by the United Nations throughout. In the analyses of the American states, we have used the U.S. Census data as published. However, even if someone had a strong objection to the figures for one or other society, it would clearly not change the overall picture presented in Figure 13.1. The same applies to the figures we used for all the health and social problems. Each set is as provided at source, we take them as published with no ifs or buts. The only social problem we have encountered which tends to be more common in more equal countries, but not significantly among more equal states in the USA, is, perhaps surprisingly, suicide. The reasons for this are twofold. First, in some countries, suicide is not more common lower down the social scale. In Britain, a well-defined social gradient has only emerged in recent decades. Second, suicide is often inversely related to homicide. There seems to be something in the psychological cliché that anger sometimes goes in and sometimes goes out. Do you blame yourself or others for things that go wrong? In Chapter 3, we noted the rise in the tendency to blame the outside world, defensive narcissism, and the contrasts between the U.S. and Japan. It is notable that in a paper on health in Harlem in New York, suicide was the only cause of death which was less common there than in the rest of the USA. Other explanations? <laughs>
It is clear that there is something which affects how well or badly societies do across a wide range of social problems. But how sure can we be that it is inequality? Before discussing whether inequality plays a causal role, let us first see whether there might be any quite different explanations. Although people have occasionally suggested that it is the English-speaking countries which do badly, that doesn't explain much of the evidence. For example, take mental health, where the worst performers among the countries for which there is comparable data are English-speaking. In Chapter 5, we showed that the highest rates are in the USA, followed in turn by Australia, UK, New Zealand and Canada. But even among those countries there is a very strong correlation between the prevalence of mental illness and inequality. So inequality explains why English-speaking countries do badly, and it explains which ones do better or worse than others. Nor is it just the USA and Britain, two countries which do have a lot in common which do badly on most outcomes. Portugal also does badly. Its poor performance is consistent with its high levels of inequality, but Portugal and the USA could hardly be less alike in other respects. At the other end of the distribution, it is true that the countries which do well are dominated by the Scandinavian countries, but the country which does best of all is Japan, and Japan is in other respects as different as it could be from Sweden, which is the next best performer. Think of the contrasting family structures and the position of women in Japan and Sweden. In both cases, these two countries come at opposite ends of the spectrum. Sweden has a very high proportion of births outside marriage, and women are almost equally represented in politics. In Japan, the opposite is true. There is a similar stark contrast between the proportion of women in paid employment in the two countries. Even how they get their greater equality is quite different. Sweden does it through redistributive taxes and benefits and a large welfare state. As a proportion of national income, public social expenditure in Japan is, in contrast to Sweden, among the lowest of the major developed countries. Japan gets its high degree of equality not so much from redistribution as from a greater equality of market incomes, of earnings before taxes and benefits. Yet despite the differences, both countries do well, as their narrow income differences but almost nothing else would lead us to expect. This leads us to another important point. Greater equality can be gained either by using taxes and benefits to redistribute very unequal incomes, or by greater equality in gross incomes before taxes and benefits, which leaves less need for redistribution. So big government may not always be necessary to gain the advantages of a more equal society, the same applies to other areas of government expenditure. For countries in our international analysis, we collected OECD figures on public social expenditure as a proportion of gross domestic product, and found it entirely unrelated to our index of health and social problems. Perhaps rather counterintuitively, it also made no difference to the association between inequality and the index. Part of the reason for this is that governments may spend either to prevent social problems or, where income differences have widened, to deal with the consequences. Examples of these contrasting routes to greater equality, which we have seen in the international data, can also be found among the 50 states of the USA. Although the states which perform well are dominated by ones which have more generous welfare provisions, the state which performs best is New Hampshire, which has among the lowest public social expenditure of any state. Like Japan, it appears to get its high degree of equality through an unusual equality of market incomes. Research using data for U.S. states, which tried to see whether better welfare services explained the better performance of more equal states, found that although in the U.S. setting services appear to make a difference, they do not account fully for why more equal states do so much better. The really important implication is that how a society becomes more equal is less important than whether or not it actually does so. Ethnicity and inequality People sometimes wonder whether ethnic divisions in societies account for the relationship between inequality and the higher frequency of health and social problems. There are two reasons for thinking that there might be a link. 
First is the idea that some ethnic groups are inherently less capable and more likely to have problems. This must be rejected because it is simply an expression of racial prejudice. The other, more serious possibility is that minorities often do worse because they are excluded from the educational and job opportunities needed to do well. In this view, prejudice against minorities might cause ethnic divisions to be associated with bigger income differences, and flowing from this also with worse health and more frequent social problems. This would, however, produce a relation between income inequality and worse scores on our index through very much the same processes as are responsible for the relationship wherever it occurs. Ethnic divisions may increase social exclusion and discrimination, but ill health and social problems become more common the greater the relative deprivation people experience, whatever their ethnicity. People nearer the bottom of society almost always face downward discrimination and prejudice. There are, of course, important differences between what is seen as class prejudice in societies without ethnic divisions and as racial prejudice where there are. Although the cultural marks of class are derived inherently from status differentiation, they are less indelible than differences in skin color. But when differences in ethnicity, religion or language come to be seen as markers of low social status and attract various downward prejudices, social divisions and discrimination may increase. In the USA, state income inequality is closely related to the proportion of African Americans in the state's population. The states with wider income differences tend to be those with larger African American populations. The same states also have worse outcomes, for instance for health, among both the black and the white population. The ethnic divide increases prejudice and so widens income differences. The result is that both communities suffer. Rather than whites enjoying greater privileges resulting from a larger and less well-paid black community, the consequence is that life expectancy is shorter among both black and white populations. So the answer to the question as to whether what appears to be the effects of inequality may actually be the result of ethnic divisions is that the two involve most of the same processes and should not be seen as alternative explanations. The prejudice which often attaches to ethnic divisions may increase inequality and its effects. Where ethnic differences have become strongly associated with social status divisions, Ethnic divisions may provide almost as good an indicator of the scale of social status differentiation as income inequality. In this situation, it has been claimed that income differences are trumped, statistically speaking, by ethnic differences in the USA. However, other papers examining this claim have rejected it. The USA, with its ethnic divisions, is only one of a great many contexts in which the impact of income inequality has been tested. We reviewed 168 published reports of research examining the effect of inequality on health, and there are now around 200 in all. In many of these, for example Portugal, there is no possibility that effects could be attributed to ethnic divisions. An international study which included a measure of each country's ethnic mix found that it did not account for the tendency for more unequal societies to be less healthy. Different histories. Another explanation sometimes suggested for why income inequality is related to health and social problems is that what matters is not the inequality itself, but the historical factors which led societies to become more or less equal in the first place, as if inequality stood almost as a statistical monument to a history of division. This is most often suggested in relation to the USA when people notice that the more unequal states are usually, but not always, the southern states of the Confederacy, with their histories of plantation economies dependent on slave labor. However, the degree of equality or inequality in every setting has its own particular history. If we look to see how Sweden became more equal, or how Britain and a number of other countries have recently become much less so, or how the regions of Russia or China developed varying amounts of equality or inequality, we get different stories in every case. And of course these different backgrounds are important. 
There is no doubt that there are in each case specific historical explanations of why some countries, states or regions are now more or less unequal than others. But the prevalence of ill health and of social problems in those societies is not simply a patternless reflection of so many unique histories. It is instead patterned according to the amount of inequality which has resulted from those unique histories. What seems to matter, therefore, is not how societies got to where they are now, but where, in terms of their level of inequality, it is that they have now got to. That does not mean that these relations with inequality are set in stone for all time. What does change things is the stage of economic development a society has reached. In this book our focus is exclusively on the rich developed societies, but it is clear that a number of outcomes, including health and violence, are also related to inequality in less developed countries. What happens during the course of economic development is that some problems reverse their social gradients, and this changes their associations with inequality. In poorer societies, both obesity and heart disease are more common among the rich, but as societies get richer, they tend to reverse their social distribution and become more common among the poor. As a result, we find that among poorer countries, it is the more unequal ones which have more underweight people, the opposite of the pattern among the rich countries shown in Chapter 7. The age of menarche also changes its social distribution during the course of economic development. When more of the poor were undernourished, they reached sexual maturity later than girls in richer families. With the rise in living standards, that pattern too has reversed, perhaps contributing to the gradient in teenage pregnancies described in Chapter 9. All in all, it looks as if economic growth and social status differences are the most powerful determinants of many aspects of our lives. Everyone benefits. A common response to research findings in the social sciences is for people to say they are obvious, and then perhaps to add a little scornfully that there was no need to do all that expensive work to tell us what we already knew. Very often, however, that sense of knowing only seeps in with the benefit of hindsight after research results have been made known. Try asking people to predict the results in advance, and it is clear that all sorts of different things can seem perfectly plausible. Having looked at the evidence in the preceding chapters of how inequality is related to the prevalence of so many problems, we hope that most listeners will feel the picture makes immediate intuitive sense. Indeed, it may seem obvious that problems associated with relative deprivation should be more common in more unequal societies. However, if you ask people why greater equality reduces these problems, much the most common guess is that it must be because more equal societies have fewer poor people. The assumption is that greater equality helps those at the bottom. As well as being only a minor part of the proper explanation, it is an assumption which reflects our failure to recognize very important processes affecting our lives and the societies we are part of. The truth is that the vast majority of the population is harmed by greater inequality. One of the clues, and one which we initially found surprising, is just how big the differences between societies are in the rates of the various problems discussed in chapters 4 through 12. Across whole populations, rates of mental illness are five times higher in the most unequal compared to the least unequal societies. Similarly, in more unequal societies, people are five times as likely to be imprisoned, six times as likely to be clinically obese, and murder rates may be many times higher. The reason why these differences are so big is, quite simply, because the effects of inequality are not confined just to the least well-off, Instead, they affect the vast majority of the population. To take an example, the reason why life expectancy is 4.5 years shorter for the average American than it is for the average Japanese is not primarily because the poorest 10% of Americans suffer a life expectancy deficit 10 times as large, i.e. 45 years, while the rest of the population does as well as the Japanese. As epidemiologist Michael Marmot frequently points out, you could take away all the health problems of the poor and still leave most of the problems of health inequalities untouched. Or to look at it another way, 
Even if you take the death rates just of white Americans, they still do worse, as we shall see in a moment, than the populations of most other developed countries. Comparisons of health in different groups of the population in more and less equal societies show that the benefits of greater equality are very widespread. Most recently, a study in the Journal of the American Medical Association compared health among middle-aged men in the USA and England, not the whole UK. To increase comparability, the study was confined to the non-Hispanic white populations in both countries. People were divided into both income and educational categories. In Figure 13.2, rates of diabetes, hypertension, cancer, lung disease and heart disease are shown in each of three educational categories, high, medium and low. The American rates are the darker bars in the background, and those for England are the lighter ones in front. There is a consistent tendency for rates of these conditions to be higher in the US than in England, not just among the less well-educated, but across all educational levels. The same was also true of death rates and various biological markers such as blood pressure, cholesterol and stress measures. Though this is only just apparent, the authors of the study say that the social class differences in health tend to be steeper in the USA than in England, regardless of whether people are classified by income or education. In that comparison, England was the more equal and the healthier of the two countries, but there have also been similar comparisons of death rates in Sweden with those in England and Wales. To allow accurate comparisons, Swedish researchers classified a large number of Swedish deaths according to the British Occupational Class Classification. The classification runs from unskilled manual occupations in Class 5 at the bottom to professional occupations in Class 1 at the top. Figure 13.3 shows the differences they found in death rates for working-age men. Sweden, as the more equal of the two countries, had lower death rates in all occupational classes, so much so that their highest death rates in the lowest classes are lower than the highest class in England and Wales. Another similar study compared infant mortality rates in Sweden with England and Wales. Infant deaths were classified by father's occupation, and occupations were again coded the same way in each country. The results are shown in figure 13.4, Deaths of babies born to single parents, which cannot be coded by father's occupation, are shown separately. Once again, the Swedish death rates are lower right across the society. Note that as both these studies were published some time ago, the actual death rates they show are considerably higher than the current ones. Comparisons have also been made between the more and less equal of the 50 states of the USA. Here, too, the benefits of smaller income differences in the more equal states seem to spread across all income groups. One study concluded that income inequality exerts a comparable effect across all population subgroups, whether people are classified by education, race or income, so much so that the authors suggested that inequality acted like a pollutant spread throughout society. In a study of our own, we looked at the relationship between median county income and death rates in all counties of the USA. We compared the relationship between county median income and county death rates according to whether the counties were in the 25 more equal states or the 25 less equal states. As figure 13.5 shows, in both the more and less equal states, poorer counties tended, as expected, to have higher death rates. However, at all levels of income, death rates were lower in the 25 more equal states than in the 25 less equal states. Comparing counties at each level of income showed that the benefits of greater equality were largest in the poorer counties, but still existed even in the richest counties. In its essentials, the picture is much like that shown in figures 13.3 and 13.4, comparing Sweden with England and Wales. Just as among the U.S. counties, where the benefits of greater state equality extended to all income groups, so the benefits of Sweden's greater equality extended across all classes, but were biggest in the lowest classes. Figure 8.4 in Chapter 8, which compared young people's literacy scores across different countries according to their parents' level of education, 
and so indirectly according to the social status of their family of upbringing, also showed that the benefits of greater equality extend throughout society. In more equal Finland and Belgium, the benefits of greater equality were once again bigger at the bottom of the social ladder than in less equal UK and USA. But even the children of parents with the very highest levels of education did better in Finland and Belgium than they did in the more unequal UK or USA. A question which is often asked is whether even the rich benefit from greater equality. Perhaps, as John Donne said, no man is an island, even from the effects of inequality. The evidence we have been discussing typically divides the population into three or four income or educational groups, or occasionally, as in figure 13.4, into six occupational classes. In those analyses, it looks as if even the richest groups do benefit, but if, when we talk of the rich, we mean millionaires, celebrities, people in the media, running large businesses or making the news, we can only guess how they might be affected. We might feel we live in a world peopled by faces and names which keep cropping up in the media, but such people actually make up only a tiny fraction of 1% of the population, and they are just too small a proportion of the population to look at separately. Without data on such a small minority, we can only guess whether or not they are likely to escape the increased violence, drugs, or mental illness of more unequal societies. The lives and deaths of celebrities such as Britney Spears, John Lennon, Kurt Cobain, Marilyn Monroe, the assassinated Kennedy brothers, Princess Diana or Princess Margaret, suggest they might not. What the studies do make clear, however, is that greater equality brings substantial gains even in the top occupational class and among the richest or best educated quarter or third of the population, which include the small minority of the seriously rich. In short, whether we look at states or countries, the benefits of greater equality seem to be shared across the vast majority of the population. Only because the benefits of greater equality are so widely shared can the differences in the rates of problems between societies be as large as it is. As the research findings have come in over the years, the widespread nature of the benefits of greater equality seemed at first so paradoxical that they called everything into question. Several attempts by international collaborative groups to compare health inequalities in different countries suggested that health inequalities did not differ very much from one country to another. This seemed inconsistent with the evidence that health was better in more equal societies. How could greater equality improve health unless it did so by narrowing the health differences between rich and poor? At the time, this seemed a major stumbling block. Now, however, we can see how the two sets of findings are consistent. Smaller income differences improve health for everyone, but make a bigger difference to the health of the poor than the rich. If smaller income differences lead to roughly the same percentage reduction in death rates across the whole society, then when measured in relative terms, the differences in death rates between rich and poor will remain unchanged. Suppose death rates are 60 per 100,000 people in the bottom class, and only 20 per 100,000 in the top one. If you then knock 50% off death rates in all groups, you will have reduced the death rate by 30 in the bottom group, and by 10 at the top. But although the poor have had much the biggest absolute decline in death rates, there is still a threefold relative class difference in death rates. Whatever the percentage reduction in death rates, as long as it applies right across society, it will make most difference to the poor, but still leave relative measures of the difference unchanged. We can now see that the studies which once looked paradoxical were in fact telling us something important about the effects of greater equality. By suggesting that more and less equal societies contained similar relative health differentials within them, they were telling us that everyone receives roughly proportional benefits from greater equality. There are now several studies of this issue using data for US states, and at least five international ones, which provide consistent evidence that rather than being confined to the poor, the benefits of greater equality are widely spread. Causality
The relationships between inequality and poor health and social problems are too strong to be attributable to chance. They occur independently in both our test beds, and those between inequality and both violence and health have been demonstrated a large number of times in quite different settings, using data from different sources. But association on its own does not prove causality, and even if there is a causal relationship, it doesn't tell us what is cause and what is effect. The graphs we have shown have all been cross-sectional, that is, they have shown relationships at a particular point in time, rather than as they change in each country over time. However, these cross-sectional relationships could only keep cropping up if somehow they changed together. If health and inequality went their separate ways, and passed by only coincidentally like ships in the night, we would not keep catching repeated glimpses of them in close formation. There is usually not enough internationally comparable data to track relationships over time, but it has been possible to look at changes in health and inequality. One study found that changes between 1975 and 1985 in the proportion of the population living on less than half the national average income among what were then the 12 members of the European Union were significantly related to changes in life expectancy. Similarly, the decrease in life expectancy in Eastern European countries in the six years following the collapse of communism, 1989 to 95, was shown to be greatest in the countries which saw the most rapid widening of income differences. A longer-term and particularly striking example of how income distribution and health change over time is the way in which the USA and Japan swapped places in the International League Table of Life Expectancy in developed countries. In the 1950s, health in the USA was only surpassed by a few countries. Japan, on the other hand, did badly. But by the 1980s, Japan had the highest life expectancy of all developed countries, and the USA had slipped down the league and was well on the way to its current position as number 30 in the developed world. Crucially, Japanese income differences narrowed during the 40 years after the Second World War. Its health improved rapidly, overtaking other countries, and its crime rate, almost alone among developed countries, decreased. Meanwhile, U.S. income differences widened from about 1970 onwards. In Chapter 3 we provided a general explanation of why we are so sensitive to inequality, and in each of Chapters 4 through 12 we have suggested causal links specific to each health and social problem. We have also looked to see whether there might be other obvious cultural links between countries that do well or among those which do badly. But what other explanation might there be if one wanted to reject the idea of a causal relationship? Could inequality and each of the social problems be caused by some other unknown factor? Weak relationships may sometimes turn out to be a mere mirage reflecting the influence of some underlying factor, but that is much less plausible as an explanation of relationships as close as these. The fact that our index is not significantly related to average incomes in either our international testbed or among the U.S. states almost certainly rules out any underlying factor directly related to material living standards. Our analysis earlier in this chapter also rules out government social expenditure as a possible alternative explanation. As for other possible hidden factors, it seems unlikely that such an important causal factor will suddenly come to light which not only determines inequality, but which also causes everything from poor health to obesity and high prison populations. That leaves the question of which way causality goes. Occasionally, when we describe our findings, people suggest that instead of inequality causing everything else, perhaps it all works the other way round, and health and social problems cause bigger income difference. Of course, in the real world, these things do not happen in clearly defined steps which would allow us to see which comes first. The limited evidence from studies of change over time tells us only that they tend to change together. Could it be that people who succumb to health or social problems suffer a loss of income and that tends to increase inequality? Perhaps people who are sick or very overweight are less likely to have jobs or to be given promotion. Could this explain why countries with worse health and social problems are more unequal?
The short answer is no, or at least not much. First, it doesn't explain why societies that do badly on any particular health or social problem tend to do badly on all of them. If they are not all caused at least partly by the same thing, then there would be no reason why countries which, for instance, have high obesity rates should also have high prison populations. Second, some of the health and social problems are unlikely to lead to serious loss of income. Using the UNICEF index, we showed that many childhood outcomes were worse in more unequal countries. But low child well-being will not have a major influence on income inequality among adults. Nor could higher homicide rates be considered as a major cause of inequality, even if the numbers were much higher. Nor, for that matter, could expanding prison populations lead to wider income differences, rather the reverse, because measures of inequality are usually based on measures of household income which leave out institutionalized populations. Although it could be argued that teenage parents might increase inequality because they are often single and poor, some more equal countries have a high proportion of single parents but a generous welfare system which ensures that a very much smaller proportion of them are in poverty than in more unequal countries. And when the unemployed and the children of single parents are protected from poverty, they are also protected from the human damage it can cause. However, there is a more fundamental objection to the idea that causality might go from social problems to inequality. Earlier in this chapter we showed that it was people at almost all income levels, not just the poor, who do worse in more unequal societies. Even when you compare groups of people with the same income, you find that those in more unequal societies do worse than those on the same income in more equal societies. Though some more unequal societies have more poor people, most of the relationship with inequality is, as we pointed out earlier, not explained by the poor. The effects are much more widespread. So even if there is some loss of income among those who are sick or affected by some social problem, this does not begin to explain why people who remain on perfectly good incomes still do worse in more unequal societies. Another alternative approach is to suggest that the real cause is not income distribution, but something more like changes in ideology, a shift perhaps to a more individualistic economic philosophy or view of society, such as the so-called neoliberal thinking. Different ideologies will of course affect not only government policies, but also decisions taken in economic institutions throughout society. They are one of very many different factors which can affect the scale of income differences. But to say that a change in ideology can affect income distribution is not at all the same as saying that it can also affect all the health and social problems we have discussed, regardless of what happens to income distribution. Although it does look as if neoliberal policies widened income differences, see chapter 16, there was no government intention to lower social cohesion or to increase violence, teenage births, obesity, drug abuse and everything else. So while changes in government ideology may sometimes be among the causes of changes in income distribution, this is not part of a package of policies intended to increase the prevalence of social problems. Their increase is instead an unintended consequence of the changes in income distribution. Rather than challenging the causal role of inequality in increasing health and social problems, if governments understood the consequences of widening income differences, they would be keener to prevent them. Economists have never suggested that poor health and social problems were the real determinants of income inequality. Instead, they have concentrated on the contributions of things like taxes and benefits, international competition, changing technology, and the mix of skills needed by industry. None of these is obviously connected to the frequency of health and social problems. In Chapter 16, we shall touch on the factors responsible for major changes in inequality in different countries. A difficulty in proving causality is that we cannot experimentally reduce the inequalities in half our sample of countries and not in the others, and then wait to see what happens. But purely observational research can still produce powerful science, as astronomy shows. There are, however, some experimental studies which do support causality working in the way our argument suggests. Some of them have already been mentioned in earlier chapters – 
In Chapter 8 on Education, we described experiments which show how much people's performance is affected by being categorized as socially inferior. Indian children from lower castes solved mazes just as well as those from higher castes until their low caste was made known. Experiments in the United States have shown that African-American students, but not white students, do less well when they are told a test is a test of ability than they do on the same test when they are told it is not a test of ability. We also described the famous blue eyes experiments with schoolchildren, which showed the same processes at work. Sometimes associations which are only observed among human beings can be shown to be causal in animal experiments. For instance, studies of civil servants show cardiovascular health declines with declining social status. But how can we tell whether the damage is caused by low social status rather than by poorer material conditions? Experiments with macaque monkeys make the answer clear. Macaques form status hierarchies, but with captive colonies it is possible to ensure all animals live in the same material conditions. They are given the same diet and live in the same compounds. In addition, it is possible to manipulate social status by moving animals between groups. If you take low-status animals from different groups and house them together, some have to become high-status. Similarly, if you put high-status animals together, some will become low-status. Animals which move down in these conditions have been found to have a rapid build-up of atherosclerosis in their arteries. Similar experiments also suggest a causal relationship between low social status and the accumulation of abdominal fat. In Chapter 5, we mentioned other animal experiments which showed that when cocaine was made available to monkeys in these conditions, it was taken more by low social status animals, as if to offset their lower dopamine activity. Although we know of no experiments confirming the causality of the relation between inequality and violence, we invite anyone to go into a poor part of town and try randomly insulting a few people. We have discussed the reasons for thinking that these links are causal from a number of different perspectives. But as philosophers of science, such as Sir Karl Popper, have emphasized, an essential element in judging the success of any theory is whether it makes successful predictions. A successful theory is one which predicts the existence of previously unknown phenomena or relationships which can then be verified. The theory that more equal societies were healthier arose from one set of international data. There have now been a very large number of tests, about 200, of that theory in different settings. With the exception of studies which looked at inequality in small local areas, an overwhelming majority of these tests confirmed the theory. Second, if the link is causal, it implies that there must be a mechanism. The search for a mechanism led to the discovery that social relationships, as measured by social cohesion, trust, involvement in community life and low levels of violence, are better in more equal societies. This happened at a time when the importance of social relationships to health was beginning to be more widely recognized. Third, the theory that poor health might be one of a range of problems with social gradients related to inequality has been tested, initially on cause-specific death rates as described earlier in this chapter, and has since been amply confirmed in two different settings, as we have described in chapters 4 through 12. Fourth, at a time when there was no reason to think that inequality had psychosocial effects, the relation between health and equality seemed to imply that inequality must be affecting health through psychosocial processes related to social differentiation. That inequality does have powerful psychosocial effects is now confirmed by its links, shown in earlier chapters, with the quality of social relations and numerous behavioral outcomes. It is very difficult to see how the enormous variations which exist from one society to another in the level of problems associated with low social status can be explained without accepting that inequality is, in an essential respect, the common denominator and a hugely damaging force. 14. Our Social Inheritance Quote, Gifts make friends, and friends make gifts. Unquote. Marshall Salins, Stone Age Economics.
looking before leaping. Although attitudes to inequality have always been central to the disagreement between the political right and left, few would not prefer a friendlier society with less violence, better mental health, more involvement in community life, and so on. Now that we have shown that reducing inequality leads to a very much better society, the main sticking point is whether people believe greater equality is attainable. Our analysis has not of course compared existing societies with impossibly egalitarian imaginary ones, it is not about utopias or the extent of human perfectibility. Everything we have seen comes from comparisons of existing societies, and those societies have not been particularly unusual or odd ones. Instead, we have looked exclusively at differences between the world's richest and most successful economies, all of which enjoy democratic institutions and freedom of speech. There can be no doubt whatsoever that human beings are capable of living well in societies with inequalities as small, for instance, as Japan and the Nordic countries. Far from being impractical, the implications of our findings are probably more consistent with the institutional structures of market democracy than some people at either end of the political spectrum would like to believe. Some may still feel hesitant to take the evidence at face value. From the vantage point of more unequal countries, it may seem genuinely perplexing and difficult to understand how some apparently similar countries can function with so much less inequality. Evidence that material self-interest is the governing principle of human life seems to be everywhere. The efficiency of the market economy seems to prove that greed and avarice are, as economic theory assumes, the overriding human motivations. Even the burden of crime appears to spring from the difficulty of stopping people breaking the rules to satisfy selfish desires. Signs of a caring, sharing human nature seem thin on the ground. Some of this scepticism might be allayed by a more fundamental understanding of how we as human beings are damaged by inequality and have the capacity for something else. We need to understand how, without genetically re-engineering ourselves, greater equality allows a more sociable human nature to emerge. Two Sides of the Coin in our research for this book, social status and friendship have kept cropping up together, linked inextricably as a pair of opposites. First, they are linked as determinants of the health of each individual. As we saw in Chapter 6, friendship and involvement in social life are highly protective of good health, while low social status or bigger status differences and more inequality are harmful. Second, the two are again linked as they vary in societies. We saw in Chapter 4 that as inequality increases, sociability as measured by the strength of community life, how much people trust each other, and the frequency of violence declines. They crop up together for a third time in people's tendency to choose friends from among their near equals. Larger differences in status or wealth create a social gulf between people. What binds social status and friendship together in these different ways? The explanation is simple. They represent the two opposite ways in which human beings can come together. Social status stratification, like ranking systems or pecking orders among animals, are fundamentally orderings based on power and coercion, on privileged access to resources, regardless of others' needs. In its most naked and animal form, might is right, and the weakest eat last. Friendship is almost exactly the opposite kind of relationship. It is about reciprocity, mutuality, sharing, social obligations, cooperation, and recognition of each other's needs. Gifts are symbols of friendship because they demonstrate that the giver and receiver do not compete for access to necessities, but instead recognize and respond to each other's needs. In the well-chosen words of Marshall Salins, a social anthropologist, gifts make friends and friends make gifts. Food sharing and eating together carry the same symbolic message, and they do so particularly powerfully because food is the most fundamental of all material necessities. In times of scarcity, competition for food has the potential to be extraordinarily socially destructive.
friend or foe. Social status and friendship are so important to us because they reflect different ways of dealing with what is perhaps the most fundamental problem of social organization and political life among animals and humans alike. Because members of the same species have the same needs as each other, they have the potential to be each other's worst rivals, competing for almost everything, for food, shelter, sexual partners, a comfortable place to sit in the shade, a good nesting site, indeed for all scarce comforts and necessities. As a result, among very many species the most frequent conflicts take place not so much between members of different species, despite the danger of predators, but between members of the same species. A low-status baboon has to spend much more time keeping out of the way of a dominant baboon than in avoiding lions. Most of the bite marks and scars which subordinate animals bear come from more dominant members of their own species. You can see signs of rivalry within species all around us. You have only to watch birds at a garden feeder, or dogs fighting, or think of the banned sport of cockfighting. In each case, the conflicts are within the species. Human beings have to deal with the same problem. Writing in the 17th century, Thomas Hobbes made the danger of conflict, caused by rivalry for scarce resources, the basis of his political philosophy. As we all have the same needs, competition for scarce necessities would lead to a continuous conflict of every man against every man. Hobbes believed that because of this danger, the most important task of government was simply to keep the peace. He assumed that without the firm hand of government, life in a state of nature would be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. But perhaps Hobbes missed an important part of the story. As well as the potential for conflict, human beings have a unique potential to be each other's best source of cooperation, learning, love, and assistance of every kind. While there's not much that ostriches or otters can do for an injured member of their own species, among humans there is. But it's not just that we are able to give each other care and protection. Because most of our abilities are learned, we depend on others for the acquisition of our life skills. Similarly, our unique capacity for specialization and division of labor means that human beings have an unrivaled potential to benefit from cooperation. So as well as the potential to be each other's worst rivals, we also have the potential to be each other's greatest source of comfort and security. We have become attentive to friendship and social status because the quality of social relationships has always been crucial to well-being determining whether other people are feared rivals or vital sources of security, cooperation and support. So important are these dimensions of social life that lack of friends and low social status are among the most important sources of chronic stress affecting the health of populations in rich countries today. Although Hobbes was right about the underlying problem of the dangers of competition between members of the same species, his view of how societies managed before the development of governments with the power to keep the peace was very wide of the mark. Now that we have much more knowledge of hunting and gathering societies, it is clear that our ancestors did not live in a state of continuous conflict. Instead, as Salins pointed out, they had other ways of keeping the peace. To avoid the war of each against all, Social and economic life was based on systems of gift exchange, food sharing, and on a very high degree of equality. These served to minimize animosity and keep relations sweet. Forms of exchange involving direct expressions of self-interest, such as buying and selling or barter, were usually regarded as socially unacceptable and outlawed. These patterns demonstrate the fundamental truth. Systems of material or economic relations are systems of social relations. This is the end of the CD. The audiobook continues on the next CD. Economic Experiments Economic theory has traditionally worked on the assumption that human behavior could be explained largely in terms of an inherent tendency to maximize material self-interest but a series of experiments using economic games have now shown how far from the truth this is. In the Ultimatum game, 
Volunteers are randomly paired but remain anonymous to each other and do not meet. A known sum of money is given to the proposer, who then divides it as he or she pleases with the responder. All the responders do is merely accept or reject the offer. If rejected, neither partner gets anything, but if it is accepted, they each keep the shares of money offered. They play this game only once, so there is no point in rejecting a small offer to try to force the proposer to be more generous next time. They know there isn't going to be a next time. In this situation, self-interested responders should accept any offer, however derisory, and self-interested proposers should offer the smallest positive amount, just enough to ensure that a responder accepts it. Although experiments show that this is exactly how chimpanzees behave, it is not what happens among human beings. In practice, the average offer made by people in developed societies is usually between 43 and 48 percent, with 50 percent as the most common offer. At direct cost to ourselves, we come close to sharing equally even with people we never meet and will never interact with again. Responders tend to reject offers below about 20%. Rejected offers are money which the responder chooses to lose in order to punish the proposer and prevent them from benefiting from making a mean offer. The human desire to punish even at some personal cost has been called altruistic punishment, and it plays an important role in reinforcing cooperative behavior and preventing people freeloading. Although the studies of how people played the ultimatum game were not concerned with the levels of inequality in each society, they are nevertheless about how equally or unequally people choose to divide money between themselves and someone else. They are concerned with what people feel is a proper way to treat others, even when there is no direct contact between them and they bear the cost of any generosity. The egalitarian preferences people reveal in the ultimatum game seem to fly in the face of the actual inequalities in our societies. Chimps and Bonobos Some non-human primates are much more hierarchical than others. Looking at their different social systems, it often seems as if the amount of conflict, the quality of social relations, and the relationship between the sexes are functions of how hierarchical they are. Human beings are not, of course, bound to any one social system. Our adaptability has enabled us to live in very different social structures, both very egalitarian and very hierarchical. But some of the same effects of hierarchy on other aspects of our social systems still seem to be visible, even though the behavioral patterns are driven by culture rather than by instinct. Less hierarchical societies are less male-dominated, so as we saw in Chapter 4, the position of women is better. Similarly, the quality of social relations in more equal societies is less hostile. People trust each other more, and community life is stronger. Chapter 4. There is less violence. Chapter 10. And punishment is less harsh. Chapter 11. Around six or seven million years ago, the branch of the evolutionary tree from which we have emerged split from that which led to two different species of ape, chimpanzees and bonobos. Genetically, we are equally closely related to both of them, yet there are striking differences in their social behavior, and they illustrate sharply contrasting ways of solving the Hobbesian problem of the potential for conflict over scarce resources. Bands of chimpanzees are headed by a dominant male who gains his position largely on the basis of superior size, strength, and an ability to form alliances, often including support from females. Dominance hierarchies in any species are orderings of access to scarce resources, including, as far as males are concerned, reproductive access to females. Rankings within the dominance hierarchy are established and maintained through frequent contests, displays, and assessments of strength. In the words of primatologists Franz Duval and Franz Lanting, quote, Chimpanzees go through elaborate rituals in which one individual communicates its status to the other. Particularly between adult males, one male will literally grovel in the dust, uttering panting grunts, while the other stands bipedally, performing a mild intimidation display to make clear who ranks above whom." Unquote. Bonobos, on the other hand, behave very differently. 
Not only is there much less conflict between neighbouring groups of bonobos than between neighbouring groups of chimps, but bonobos, again unlike chimps, have a high degree of sex equality. Females are at least as important as males, and dominance hierarchies are much less pronounced. Although males are slightly larger than females, females are usually allowed to eat first. Often dubbed the caring-sharing apes, they engage in sexual activity, including mutual masturbation, frequently and in any combination of sexes and ages. Sex has evolved not only to serve reproductive functions, but also to relieve tensions in situations which in other species might cause conflict. As Duval says, sex is the glue of bonobo society. It eases conflict, signals friendliness, and calms stressful situations. Bonobos use sex to solve the problem of how to avoid conflict over access to scarce resources. Feeding time is apparently the peak of sexual activity. Even before food is thrown into their enclosure, male bonobos get erections, and males and females invite both opposite and same-sex partners for sex. Possible conflicts over non-food resources is dealt with in the same way. Although sexual activity is not a preliminary to feeding among humans, eating is a peak of sociality, whether in the form of shared family meals, meals with friends, feasts and banquets, or even in the religious symbolism of sharing bread and wine at communion. Summing up the behavioural difference between chimps and bonobos, Duval and Lanting said, If, of the twin concepts of sex and power, the chimpanzee has an appetite for the second, the bonobo clearly has one for the first. The chimpanzee resolves sexual issues, disputes, with power. The bonobo resolves power issues with sex. Perhaps as a result of these differences, bonobos are, as research has shown, better at cooperative tasks than chimps. So what makes the difference? Interestingly, a section of DNA, known to be important in the regulation of social, sexual and parenting behaviour, has been found to differ between chimps and bonobos. It is perhaps comforting to know that, at least in this section of DNA, humans have the bonobo rather than the chimp pattern, suggesting that our common ancestor may have had a preference for making love rather than war. The Social Brain The fact that we can simultaneously agree with Sartre that hell is other people, and also recognize that other people can be heaven, shows how deeply enmeshed in social life we are. Research looking for the most potent sources of stress affecting the cardiovascular system concluded that Conflicts and tensions with other people are by far the most distressing events in daily life in terms of both initial and enduring effects on emotional well-being, more so than the demands of work, money worries, or other difficulties. The quality of our relations with other people has always been so crucial not only to well-being, but also to survival and to reproductive success, that social interaction has been one of the most powerful influences on the evolution of the human brain. A remarkable indication of this is the impressively close relationship, first pointed out by the primatologist Robin Dunbar, between the normal group size of each species of primate, whether they are solitary, go about in pairs, or in smaller or larger troops, and the proportion of the brain made up of the neocortex. The larger the group size, the more neocortex we seem to need to cope with social life. Our Paleolithic ancestors usually lived in larger communities than other primates, and the neocortex makes up a larger part of our brains than it does of primates' brains. Because its growth was key to the enlargement of the human brain, the relationship suggests that the reason why we became clever may have been a response to the demands of social life. Human beings are, the world over, preoccupied with social interaction, with what people have said, what they might have been thinking, whether they were kind, offhand, rude, why they behaved as they did, what their motivations were, and how we should respond. All that social processing depends on the acquisition of a basic set of social skills, such as the ability to recognize and distinguish between faces, to use language, to infer each other's thoughts and feelings from body language, to recognize each other's peculiarities, 
to understand and heed what are acceptable and unacceptable ways of behaving in our society, to recognize and manage the impressions others form of us, and of course a basic ability to make friends and to handle conflict. But the reasons why our brains have developed as social organs to handle social interaction is not just to provide amusement, but because of the paramount importance of getting our social relationships right. That is why we mind about them. The reason why other people can be heaven or hell is because they have the potential to be our worst rivals and competitors, as well as to be our best source of cooperation, care and security. Our Dual Inheritance Different forms of social organization provide different selective environments. Characteristics which are successful in one setting may not be so in another. As a result, human beings have had to develop different mental toolkits which equip them to operate both in dominance hierarchies and in egalitarian societies. Dominance and affiliative strategies are part of our deep psychological makeup. Through them we know how to make and keep friends, how to compete for status, and when each of these two contrasting social strategies is appropriate. Dominance strategies are almost certainly pre-human in origin. They would not have been appropriate to life in the predominantly egalitarian societies of Stone Age human hunters and gatherers. In pre-human dominance hierarchies, we not only developed characteristics which help attain and express high status, but also strategies for making the best of low status if that turns out to be our lot. The danger, particularly for males in some species, is that low social status is an evolutionary dead end. To avoid that, a certain amount of risk-taking and opportunism may be desirable. Competing effectively for status requires much more than a desire for high social status and an aversion to low status. It requires a high degree of attentiveness to status differentials and the ability to make accurate social comparisons of strength and status. It is important to be able to distinguish accurately between winnable and unwinnable status conflicts. In many species, life and limb often depend on knowing when to back off and when to challenge a dominant animal for rank. Maximizing status depends on being seen as superior. This is fertile psychological ground for the development and expression of forms of downward prejudice, discrimination and snobbishness intended to express superiority. And the more we feel devalued by those above us and the fewer status resources we have to fall back on, the greater will be the desire to regain some sense of self-worth by asserting superiority over any more vulnerable groups. This is likely to be the source of the so-called bicycling reaction mentioned in Chapter 12, so-called because it is as if people bow to their superiors while kicking down on inferiors. Although it is often thought that the pursuit of status is a particularly masculine characteristic, we should not forget how much this is likely to be a response to the female preference for high-status males. As Henry Kissinger said, power is the ultimate aphrodisiac. Despite the modern impression of the permanence and universality of inequality, in the timescale of human history and prehistory, it is the current highly unequal societies which are exceptional. For over 90% of our existence as human beings, we lived almost exclusively in highly egalitarian societies. For perhaps as much as the last two million years, covering the vast majority of the time we have been anatomically modern, that is to say, looking much as we do now, human beings lived in remarkably egalitarian hunting and gathering or foraging groups. Modern inequality arose and spread with the development of agriculture. The characteristics which would have been selected as successful in more egalitarian societies would have been very different from those selected in dominance hierarchies. Rather than reflecting an evolutionary outbreak of selflessness, studies of modern and recent hunter-gatherer societies suggest that they maintained equality not only through the institutions of food-sharing and reciprocal gift exchange, but also through what have been called counter-dominant strategies. Sharing was what has been described as vigilant sharing, with people watching to see that they got their fair share.
the counter-dominant strategies through which these societies maintained their equality functioned almost as alliances of everyone against anyone whose behavior threatened people's sense of their own autonomy and equality. The suggestion is that these strategies may have developed as a generalized form of the kind of alliances which primatologists often describe being formed between two or three animals to enable them to gang up on and depose the dominant male. Observational studies of modern and recent foraging societies suggest that counter-dominant strategies normally involve anything from teasing and ridicule to ostracism and violence, which are turned against anyone who tries to dominate others. An important point about these societies is that they show that the selfish desires of individuals for greater wealth and preeminence can be contained or diverted to less socially damaging forms of expression. A number of psychological characteristics would have been selected to help us manage in egalitarian societies. These are likely to include our strong conception and valuation of fairness, which makes it easier for people to reach agreement without conflict when sharing scarce resources. Visible even in young children, our concern for fairness sometimes seems so strong that we might wonder how it is that social systems with great inequality are tolerated. Similarly, the sense of indebtedness, now recognized as universal in human societies, which we experience after having received a gift, serves to prompt reciprocity and prevent freeloading, so sustaining friendship. As the experimental economic games which we discussed showed, there is also evidence that we can feel sufficiently infuriated by unfairness that we are willing to punish, even at some personal cost to ourselves. Another characteristic which is perhaps important is our tendency to feel a common sense of identity and interdependence with those with whom we share food and other resources as equals. They form the in-group, the us, with whom we empathize and share a sense of identity. In various religious institutions and political organizations, sharing has been used to create a sense of brotherhood or sisterhood, and whether we say a society has an extended or nuclear family system is a matter of the extent of the sharing group, whether more distant relations have a call on each other's resources. Writing in the middle of the 19th century, de Tocqueville believed that substantial differences in material living standards between people was a formidable barrier to empathy. As we saw in Chapter 4, he thought the differences in material conditions prevented the French nobility from empathizing with the sufferings of the peasantry, and also explained why American slave owners were so unaffected by the suffering of their slaves. He also thought the strong community life he saw among whites on his visit to the USA in 1830 was a reflection of what he called the equality of conditions. A very important source of the close social integration in an egalitarian community is the sense of self-realization we can get when we successfully meet others' needs. This is often seen as a mysterious quality, almost as if it were above explanation. It comes, of course, from our need to feel valued by others. We gain a sense of being valued when we do things which others appreciate. The best way of ensuring that we remain included in the cooperative hunting and gathering group and reducing the risk of being cast out, ostracized and preyed upon was to do things which people appreciated. Nowadays, whether it is cooking a nice meal, telling jokes or providing for people's needs in other ways, it can give rise to a sense of self-worth. It is this capacity, now most visible in parenting, which, long before the development of market mechanisms and wage labor, enabled humans, almost uniquely, to gain the benefits of a division of labor and specialization within cooperative groups of interdependent individuals. We have, then, social strategies to deal with very different kinds of social organization. At one extreme, dominance hierarchies are about self-advancement and status competition. Individuals have to be self-reliant, and other people are encountered mainly as rivals for food and mates. At the other extreme is mutual interdependence and cooperation, in which each person's security depends on the quality of their relationships with others, and a sense of self-worth comes less from status than from the contribution made to the well-being of others. Rather than the overt pursuit of material self-interest, 
Affiliative strategies depend on mutuality, reciprocity, and the capacity for empathy and emotional bonding. In practice, of course, God and mammon coexist in every society, and the territory of each varies depending on the sphere of life, the economic system, and on individual differences. Early Experience so different are the kinds of society which humans have had to cope with that the processes which adapt us to deal with any given social system start very early in life. Growing up in a society where you must be prepared to treat others with suspicion, watch your back and fight for what you can get, requires very different skills from those needed in a society where you depend on empathy, reciprocity and cooperation. Psychologists and others have always told us that the nature of a child's early life affects the development of their personality and the kind of people they grow up to be in adult life. Examples of a special capacity in early life to adapt to local environmental circumstances exist throughout animal and even plant life. In humans, stress responses and processes shaping our emotional and mental characteristics go through a kind of tuning or programming process which starts in the womb and continues through early childhood. The levels of stress which women experience in pregnancy are passed on to affect the development of babies before birth. Stress hormones cross the placental barrier and affect the baby's hormone levels and growth in the womb. Also important in influencing children's development is the stress they experience themselves in infancy. The quality of care and nurture, the quality of attachment and how much conflict there is, all affect stress hormones and the child's emotional and cognitive development. Although not yet identified in humans, sensitive periods in early life may sometimes involve epigenetic processes by which early exposures and experience may switch particular genes on or off to pattern development in the longer term. Differences in nursing behaviour in mother rats have been shown to affect gene expression in their offspring, so providing ways of adapting to the environment in the light of early experience. In the past, there was a strong tendency simply to regard children who had had a very stressful early life as damaged, but it looks increasingly as if what is happening is that early experience is being used to adapt the child to deal with contrasting kinds of social reality. The emotional makeup which prepares you to live in a society in which you have to fend for yourself, watch your back and fight for every bit you can get, is very different from what is needed if you grow up in a society in which, to take the opposite extreme, you depend on empathy, reciprocity and cooperation, and in which your security depends on maintaining good relations with others. Children who experience more stress in early life may be more aggressive, less empathetic, and probably better at dealing with conflict. In effect, early life serves to provide a taster of the quality of social relations you are likely to have to cope with in adulthood. So important are these processes that we need to see parenting as part of a system for passing on the adult's experience of adversity to the child. When people talk of poor parenting, or say people lack parenting skills, the truth is often that the way parents treat their children actually serves to pass on their experience of adversity to the child. Although this is usually an unconscious process, in which the parent simply feels short-tempered, depressed or at their wit's end, it is sometimes also conscious. In a recent court case, three women were found to have encouraged their toddlers to fight, goading them to hit each other in the face and to kick a sibling who had fallen to the ground. The children's grandmother showed no remorse, insisting that it would harden them up. Given their experience of life, that was clearly what they thought was needed. Many studies have shown that forms of behaviour experienced in childhood tend to be mirrored in adulthood. Children who have, for example, experienced violence or abuse are more likely to become abusing and violent when they reach adulthood. The effects of early experience are long-lasting. Children stressed in early life, or whose mothers were stressed during pregnancy, are more likely to suffer in middle and old age from a number of stress-related diseases, including heart disease, diabetes and stroke. 
The result is that some of the effects of widening income differences in a society may not be short-lived. Increased inequality means that more families suffer the strains of living on relatively low incomes and numerous studies have shown the damaging effects on child development. When parents experience more adversity, family life suffers and the children grow up less empathetic but ready to deal with more antagonistic relationships. Many of the problems which we have seen to be related to inequality involve adult responses to status competition, but we have also found that a number of problems affecting children are related to inequality. These include juvenile conflict, poor peer relationships and educational performance at school, childhood obesity, infant mortality and teenage pregnancy. Problems such as these are likely to reflect the way the stresses of a more unequal society, of low social status, have penetrated family life and relationships. Inequality is associated with less good outcomes of many kinds because it leads to a deterioration in the quality of relationships. An important part of the reason why countries such as Sweden, Finland and Norway score well on the UNICEF Index of Child Well-Being is that their welfare systems have kept rates of relative poverty low among families. Mirror Neurons and Empathy To view the pursuit of greater equality as a process of shoehorning societies into an uncomfortably tight-fitting shoe reflects a failure to recognize our human social potential. If we understood our social needs and susceptibilities, we would see that a less unequal society causes dramatically lower rates of ill health and social problems because it provides us with a better fitting shoe. Mirror neurons are a striking example of how our biology establishes us as deeply social beings. When we watch someone doing something, mirror neurons in our brains fire as if to produce the same actions. The system is likely to have developed to serve learning by imitation. Watching a person doing a particular sequence of actions, one research paper uses the example of a curtsy as an external observer, does not tell you how to do it yourself nearly as well as if your brain was acting as if you were making the same movements in sympathy. To do the same thing, you need to experience it from inside. Usually, of course, there is no visible sign of the internal processes of identification that enable us to put ourselves inside each other's actions. However, the electrical activity triggered by these specialized neurons is detectable in the muscles. It has been suggested that similar processes might be behind our ability to empathize with each other and even behind the way people sometimes flinch while watching a film if they see pain inflicted on someone else we react as if it was happening to us. Though equipped with the potential to empathize very closely with others, how much we develop and use this potential is again affected by early childhood. Oxytocin and trust. Another example of how our biology dovetails with the nature of social relations involves a hormone called oxytocin and its effects on our willingness to trust each other. In Chapter 4, we saw that people in more unequal societies were much less likely to trust each other. Trust is, of course, an important ingredient in any society, but it becomes essential in modern developed societies with a high degree of interdependence. In many different species, oxytocin affects social attachment and bonding, both bonding between mother and child and pair bonding between sexual partners. Its production is stimulated by physical contact during sexual intercourse, in childbirth, and in breastfeeding where it controls milk letdown. However, in a number of mammalian species including humans, it also has a role in social interaction more generally, affecting approach and avoidance behavior. The effect of oxytocin on people's willingness to trust each other was tested in an experiment involving a trust game. The results showed that those given oxytocin were much more likely to trust their partner. In similar experiments, it was found that these effects worked both ways round. Not only does receiving oxytocin make people more likely to trust, but being trusted also leads to increases in oxytocin. These effects were found even when the only evidence of trust or mistrust between people was the numerical decisions communicated through computer terminals.
cooperative pleasure, and painful exclusion. Other experiments have shown how the sense of cooperation stimulates the reward centers in the brain. The experience of mutual cooperation, even in the absence of face-to-face -face contact or real communication, leads reliably to stimulation of the reward centers. The researchers suggested that the neural reward networks serve to encourage reciprocity and mutuality while resisting the temptation to act selfishly. In contrast to the rewards of cooperation, experiments using brain scans have shown that the pain of social exclusion involves the same areas of the brain as are stimulated when someone experiences physical pain. Naomi Eisenberger, a psychologist at UCLA, got volunteers to play a computer bat and ball game with, as it seemed on the screen, two other participants. The program was arranged so that after a while the other two virtual participants would start to pass the ball just between each other, so excluding the experimental subject. Brain scans showed that the areas of the brain activated by this experience of exclusion were the same areas as are activated by physical pain. In various species of monkeys, these same brain areas have been found to play a role in offspring calling for and mothers providing maternal protection. These connections have always been understood intuitively. When we talk about hurt feelings or a broken heart, we recognize the connection between physical pain and the social pain caused by the breaking of close social bonds, by exclusion and ostracism. Evolutionary psychologists have shown that the tendency to ostracize people who do not cooperate and to exclude them from the shared proceeds of cooperation is a powerful way of maintaining high standards of cooperation. And just as the ultimatum game showed that people were willing to punish a mean allocator by rejecting, at some cost to themselves, allocations that seemed unfair, so we appear to have a desire to exclude people who do not cooperate. Social pain is of course central to rejection and is the opposite of the pleasures discussed earlier of being valued or of the sense of self-realization which can come from others' appreciation of what we have done for them. The powers of inclusion and exclusion indicate our fundamental need for social integration and are no doubt part of the explanation of why friendship and social involvement are so protective of health. Chapter 6 Social class and status differences almost certainly cause similar forms of social pain. Unfairness, inequality and the rejection of cooperation are all forms of exclusion. The experiments which demonstrated the performance effects of being classified as inferior, which we saw in Chapter 8 among Indian children in different castes, in experiments with school children, and among African American students told they were doing tests of ability, indicated the social pain related to exclusion. Part of the same picture is the social pain which sometimes triggers violence, Chapter 10, when people feel they are put down, humiliated, or suffer loss of face. For a species which thrives on friendship and enjoys cooperation and trust, which has a strong sense of fairness, which is equipped with mirror neurons allowing us to learn our way of life through a process of identification, it is clear that social structures which create relationships based on inequality, inferiority and social exclusion must inflict a great deal of social pain. In this light, we can perhaps begin not only to see why more unequal societies are so socially dysfunctional, but through that perhaps also to feel more confident that a more humane society may be a great deal more practical than the highly unequal ones in which so many of us live now. 15. Equality and Sustainability Quote, The one who dies with the most toys wins, unquote. U.S. bumper sticker. Over the next generation or so, politics seem likely to be dominated either by efforts to prevent runaway global warming, or if they fail, by attempts to deal with its consequences. Carbon emissions per head in rich countries are between two and five times higher than the world average, but cutting their emissions by a half or four-fifths will not be enough. World totals are already too high, and allowances must be made for economic growth in poorer countries. 
How might greater equality and policies to reduce carbon emissions go together? Given what inequality does to a society, and particularly how it heightens competitive consumption, it looks not only as if the two are complementary, but also that governments may be unable to make big enough cuts in carbon emissions without also reducing inequality. Sustainability and the quality of life Ever since the Brandt Report in 1980, people have suggested that social and environmental sustainability go together. It is fortunate that just when the human species discovers that the environment cannot absorb further increases in emissions, we also learn that further economic growth in the developed world no longer improves health, happiness or measures of well-being. On top of that, we have now seen that there are ways of improving the quality of life in rich countries without further economic growth. But if we do not need to consume more, what would be the consequences of consuming less? Would making the necessary cuts in carbon emissions mean reducing present material living standards below what people in the rich world could accept as an adequate quality of life? Is sustainability compatible with retaining our quality of life? One starting point for answering this question is figure 15.1, which shows that low infant mortality rates can be achieved without high levels of carbon emissions. Clearly, many countries achieve levels of infant mortality as low as the richest countries while producing much less carbon. However, a more comprehensive answer to the question comes from the World Wildlife Fund, WWF, which analyzed data relating the quality of life in each country to the size of the ecological footprint per head of population. To measure the quality of life, they used the UN Human Development Index, HDI, which combines life expectancy, education, and gross domestic product per capita. Figure 15.2 uses WWF data to show the relation between each country's ecological footprint per head and its score on the UN Human Development Index. Scarcely a single country combines a quality of life above the WWF threshold of 0 0.8 on the HDI with an ecological footprint which is globally sustainable. Cuba is the only one which does so. Despite its much lower income levels, its life expectancy and infant mortality rates are almost identical to those in the United States. The fact that at least one country manages to combine acceptable living standards with a sustainable economy proves that it can be done. However, because the combination is achieved without access to the greenest and most fuel-efficient technology, means it could be done more easily in countries with access to more advanced technology than Cuba has. With the advantages of power generation from renewables, environmentally friendly new technologies and greater equality, we can be confident that it is possible to combine sustainability with a high quality of life. Before leaving figure 15.2, it is worth noting that much of the reason why the highest scores on the HDI are achieved by countries with the largest ecological feat is merely a reflection of the fact that gross domestic product per head is one of the components of the HDI. Reducing carbon emissions fairly Improving the real quality of our lives at lower levels of consumption is only one of the contributions equality can make to reducing carbon emissions. There are two others. First, if policies to cut emissions are to gain public acceptance, they must be seen to be applied fairly. The richer you are and the more you spend, the more you are likely to contribute to global warming. The carbon emissions caused by the consumption of a rich person may be ten times as high as the consumption of a poorer person in the same society. If the rich are the worst offenders, then fair remedies must surely affect them most. Policies that squeeze the poor while allowing the rich to continue to produce much higher levels of emissions would be unlikely to gain widespread public support. A system of individual carbon rations has been proposed as one way of reducing carbon emissions fairly. The total permissible level of emissions can be divided by the population to give an equal share or quota of allowable emissions per head. There is an obvious parallel here with the egalitarian policies implemented in Britain during the Second World War. To gain public cooperation in the war effort, the burden had to be seen to be fairly shared.
Titmus regarded this as the rationale for the introduction of rationing and more progressive income taxes, as well as for subsidizing necessities and taxing luxuries. One suggestion now is that people should use an electronic card to cover payments for fuel, power and air travel. Those using less than their ration would be able to sell their unused allocation back to a carbon bank, from where it could then be bought by richer people wanting to use more than their allocation of fuel and power. Under such a system of tradable carbon quotas, high consumers would be compensating low consumers and income would be redistributed from rich to poor. In 2006, the then Minister of the Environment in Britain, David Miliband, proposed such a system and a small trial was begun in Manchester in 2007. To safeguard the poor, it may be necessary to prevent people selling unused parts of their ration till the end of the period it covers, so only allowances already saved could be traded. New technology is not enough on its own. We might hope that new technology will save us from the rigours of carbon rationing. However, although green innovations which reduce fuel consumption and carbon emissions are an essential part of the change we need to make, they cannot solve the problem on their own. Imagine that a new generation of car engines is introduced which halve fuel consumption. Driving would then be cheaper and that would save us money, but it is money which we would almost certainly spend on something else. We might spend it on driving more, or on buying a bigger car, or on more power-hungry electrical equipment, perhaps a bigger fridge-freezer. But however we spend the money put back in our pockets by more efficient car engines, our additional consumption will probably add to carbon emissions elsewhere and lose much of the original environmental benefit. The same logic applies in almost all areas. More power-efficient washing machines or better insulated houses will help the environment. But they also cut our bills, and that immediately means we lose some of the environmental gain by spending the saved money on something else. As cars have become more fuel-efficient, we have chosen to drive further. As houses have become better insulated, we have raised standards of heating, and as we put in energy-saving light bulbs, the chances are that we start to think it doesn't matter so much leaving them on. Because energy-saving innovations mean that we can buy more, they are like economic growth. Though they give us higher material living standards for any level of carbon emissions, much of the carbon savings gets swallowed up by higher living standards. The only question is how much of the benefits of greener technology get eaten up in higher consumption. As many countries have adopted smaller, more fuel-efficient cars, national emissions have usually continued to rise despite the increased efficiency. A steady-state economy It is clear that we have to move to something more like the steady-state economy first proposed by economist Herman Daly. But how do we do that when, as Murray Bookchin, the American social ecologist and libertarian philosopher, said, Capitalism can no more be persuaded to limit growth than a human being can be persuaded to stop breathing. When Daly developed the concept of a steady-state economy, people were more concerned about using up the Earth's finite mineral and agricultural resources than they were with global warming. He suggested that we should have physical quotas on the extraction of minerals and that the use of the world's resources should be prevented from growing. Limiting world oil and coal production might turn out to be a very effective way of limiting global warming. Innovation and change would then be concentrated on using finite resources more effectively for the benefit of humankind. Think of material living standards as given by the stock of goods in use rather than the rate of flow from consumption to waste. The faster things wear out and need replacing, the more they contribute to the flow and to waste. If material living standards depend on the goods we have in use, then each thing that wears out is a subtraction from that. Rather than serving as consumers, helping business to keep sales up, we need incentives to build and maintain longer-lasting goods of every kind. Clearly, any system for tackling these problems has to treat rich and poor countries differently.
India, producing 1.6 tonnes of carbon per person annually, cannot be treated the same as the USA, producing 24.0 per person. Any regulatory system has to include policies for contraction and convergence, or cap and share. Both approaches propose a year-on-year -year contraction in permitted emission levels, leading to an eventual convergence on equal per capita emissions across the planet. It would be a mistake to think that a steady-state economy would mean stagnation and lack of change. Most economic development and progress comes from innovation, from consuming different things rather than more of the same things. Fixing limits on resource consumption would not reduce the speed of scientific discovery and technical innovation. Indeed, as we shall see in the next chapter, continued rapid technological advances, such as digitization, electronic communications and virtual systems, creating weightless sectors of the economy, make it very much easier to combine high living standards with low resource consumption and emissions. Inequality and Consumerism the second link between greater equality and the prevention of global warming involves the consumerism which makes it so much harder to contain economic activity within sustainable levels. Our addiction to shopping and spending makes many people think that we have already lost the battle against global warming. As well as leading most of us into an ostrich-like denial of its implications for our way of life, the strength of our consumerist tendencies has reduced governments to a state of paralysis, too nervous of the electorate to implement any policy capable of making a real difference. How are we to transform this culture and make it possible to reduce the threat to the planet? Greater equality gives us the crucial key to reducing the cultural pressures to consume. In a period when people seem to have been less guarded, Henry Wallach, a former governor of the Federal Reserve and professor of economics at Yale, said, Growth is a substitute for equality of income. So long as there is growth, there is hope, and that makes large income differentials tolerable. But this relation holds both ways round. It is not simply that growth is a substitute for equality, it is that greater equality makes growth much less necessary. It is a precondition for a steady-state economy. A great deal of what drives consumption is status competition. For most of us, it probably feels less like being competitive and more like a kind of defensiveness. If we don't raise our standards, we get left behind and everything starts to look dowdy, shabby and out of date. Robert Frank, an economist at Cornell University, has described how standards are inherently relative and involve comparisons with others. In his book, Falling Behind, how Rising Inequality Harms the Middle Class, 2007, he puts it like this, quote, No one denies that a car experienced in 1950 as having brisk acceleration would seem sluggish to most drivers today. Similarly, a house of given size is more likely to be viewed as spacious the larger it is relative to other houses in the same local environment, and an effective interview suit is one that compares favorably with those worn by other applicants for the same job. In short, evaluation depends always and everywhere on context." Unquote. The problem is that second-class goods make us look like second-class people. By comparison with the rich and famous, the rest of us appear second-rate and inferior, and the bigger the differences, the more noticeable and important they become. As inequality increases status competition, we have to struggle harder to keep up. While the rich may believe their willingness to spend huge sums on a watch, a car, or some other luxury item reflects their appreciation of the attention to detail or craftsmanship, what really makes the difference is what their purchases say about them relative to the rest of us. As every advertiser knows, it serves to set them apart as people of distinction, social distinction. Only the best people can have nothing but the best. The other side of this coin is that the consumption of the rich reduces everyone else's satisfaction with what they have by showing it up as inferior, as less than the best. In his book Happiness, Richard Layard, founder of the Centre for Economic Performance at the London School of Economics, treated this dissatisfaction as a cost which the rich impose on the rest of society.
rather as if it were smoke from a factory chimney, he estimated the cost that the rich should pay for it. He was, however, unaware of the effects of inequality on the health and social problems which we have outlined. He based his calculations solely on the loss of satisfaction or happiness among the rest of the population, and concluded that a 60% tax rate on the better off might cover that cost. Presumably that should be over and above the tax rates other people pay. The idea that inequality ratchets up the competitive pressure to consume is not just speculation. It has observable effects. While inequality has been rising in the USA and Britain, there has been a long-term decline in savings and a rise in debt. Robert Frank notes that in 1998, even though the American economy was booming as never before, one family in 68 filed for bankruptcy, four times the rate in the early 1980s before the most dramatic rises in inequality. By 2002, unpaid credit card debt was $9,000 for the average cardholder. Looking at changes over a 10-year period, Frank found that bankruptcy rates rose most in parts of the USA where inequality had risen most. The growth of inequality made it harder for people to maintain standards relative to others. The increased pressure to consume led people to save less and borrow more, to such an extent that the expansion of consumer demand became one of the main drivers of the long economic boom and financial speculation which ended in crisis. This fits well with the fact that spending on advertising also varies with inequality. In more unequal countries, a higher proportion of gross domestic product is spent on advertising, with the USA and New Zealand spending twice as much as Norway and Denmark. Another indicator of how inequality increases the pressure to consume comes from the way working hours vary in different countries in relation to inequality. A study of working hours in OECD countries by Sam Bowles, Professor Emeritus of Economics at the University of Massachusetts, showed not only that more unequal countries tend to have longer working hours, but also that differences in working hours changed in line with changes in inequality over several decades. The relationship between greater inequality and longer working hours is shown in Figure 15.3, People in more unequal countries do the equivalent of two or three months extra work a year. A loss of the equivalent of an extra eight or twelve weeks holiday is a high price to pay for inequality. Another study, this time using data within the USA, found that married women were more likely to go out to work if their sister's husband earned more than their own husband. A similar study suggested that the decisions married women make about taking paid work are also affected by less personal inequalities. It looked at women who were married to employed men and found that they were more likely to take a job themselves if they lived in an area in which men's incomes were more unequal. The evidence we have described from a number of different sources on savings, debt, bankruptcy rates, spending on advertising and working hours all concurs with the view that inequality does indeed increase the pressure to consume. If an important part of consumerism is driven by emulation, status competition, or simply having to run to keep up with everyone else, and is basically about social appearances and position, this would explain why we continue to pursue economic growth despite its apparent lack of benefits. If everyone wants more money because it improves self-image and status in relation to others, then each person's desire to be richer does not add up to a societal desire for economic growth. How much people's desire for more income is really a desire for higher status has been demonstrated in a simple experiment. People were asked to say whether they'd prefer to be less well-off than others in a rich society or have a much lower income in a poorer society but be better off than others. 50% of the participants thought they would trade as much as half their real income if they could live in a society in which they would be better off than others. This shows how much we value status, and explains why, as we saw in Chapter 2, the income differences within rich societies matter so much more than the income differences between them. Once we have enough of the necessities of life, it is the relativities which matter. When Bowles and Park first demonstrated the relationship between inequality and working hours, figure 15.3, they quoted Thorstein Veblen, who said, 
The only practicable means of impressing one's pecuniary ability on the unsympathetic observers of one's everyday life is an unremitting demonstration of the ability to pay. Veblen's theory of the leisure class, published in 1899, was the first major work on the relationship between consumption and social stratification. It was he who introduced the term conspicuous consumption and emphasized the importance of pecuniary emulation and invidious comparisons. Because the advertising industry plays on insecurities about how we are seen, it has made us more aware of the psychology of consumption. But Veblen wrote long before we were so bombarded with advertising. So rather than blaming these problems entirely on advertising, we should recognize that it simply amplifies and makes use of vulnerabilities which are there anyway. Economists now use the term Veblen effect to refer to the way goods are chosen for their social value rather than their usefulness. And research confirms that the tendency to look for goods which confer status and prestige is indeed stronger for things which are more visible to others. Too often, consumerism is regarded as if it reflected a fundamental human material self-interest and possessiveness. That, however, could hardly be further from the truth. Our almost neurotic need to shop and consume is instead a reflection of how deeply social we are. Living in unequal and individualistic societies, we use possessions to show ourselves in a good light, to make a positive impression, and to avoid appearing incompetent or inadequate in the eyes of others. Consumerism shows how powerfully we are affected by each other. Once we have enough of the basic necessities for comfort, possessions matter less and less in themselves, and are used more and more for what they say about their owners. Ideally, our impressions of each other would depend on face-to-face -face interactions in the course of community life, rather than on outward appearances in the absence of real knowledge of each other. That point takes us back to the discussion in Chapter 4 of the evidence that inequality weakens community life. The weakening of community life and the growth of consumerism are related. If, to cut carbon emissions, we need to limit economic growth severely in the rich countries, then it is important to know that this does not mean sacrificing improvements in the real quality of life, in the quality of life as measured by health, happiness, friendship and community life, which really matters. However, rather than simply having fewer of all the luxuries which substitute for and prevent us recognizing our more fundamental needs, inequality has to be reduced simultaneously. We need to create more equal societies able to meet our real social needs. Instead of policies to deal with global warming being experienced simply as imposing limits on the possibilities of material satisfaction, they need to be coupled with egalitarian policies which steer us to new and more fundamental ways of improving the quality of our lives. The change is about a historic shift in the sources of human satisfaction from economic growth to a more sociable society. In his speech accepting the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize on behalf of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change which he chairs, Rajendra Pachauri described how global warming would reduce agricultural yields, food and water supplies for hundreds of millions of people and so lead to increasing conflict. He spoke before the contribution of biofuel crops to rising world food prices had been clearly recognized. The task of responding adequately to the threat of global warming needs to be seen as bigger and more important than any of us. But if everyone, individuals, corporations, whole nations, feels it is almost their duty to get round regulations, to exploit whatever loopholes they can, as has long been taken as the norm with taxation, then the task is lost. As we write, tankers of biofuels are crossing the Atlantic from Europe to the USA and back in order to pick up the US government subsidy paid when small quantities of petroleum are added, which could just as well have been added in Europe without every litre crossing the Atlantic twice. Reversing the intended effect of regulations for private gain is an expression of the dominance of attitudes which makes it much harder to respond adequately to the threat of global warming. Tackling climate change depends on world cooperation like never before,
We cannot succeed if in practice everyone is trying to circumvent the regulations. Cheating on regulations and the pursuit of short-term sectional or self-interest becomes not just anti-social but anti-humanity. Policies to reduce carbon emissions depend on a wider sense of social responsibility, of cooperation and public spiritedness. Here again the evidence suggests that more equal societies do better. We have seen, Chapter 4, that they are more socially cohesive and have higher levels of trust which foster public spiritedness. We have also seen how this carries over into international relations. More equal societies give more in development aid and score better on the Global Peace Index. An indication that a greater sense of public responsibility in more equal countries might affect how societies respond to environmental issues can be seen in Figure 15.4, which shows that they tend to recycle a higher proportion of their waste. The data comes from Australia's Planet Ark Foundation Trust. We show each country's ranking for the proportion of waste that they recycle. So rather than assuming that we are stuck with levels of self-interested consumerism, individualism and materialism, which must defeat any attempts to develop sustainable economic systems, we need to recognize that these are not fixed expressions of human nature. Instead, they reflect the characteristics of the societies in which we find ourselves and vary even from one rich market democracy to another. At the most fundamental level, what reducing inequality is about is shifting the balance from the divisive, self-interested consumerism driven by status competition towards a more socially integrated and affiliative society. Greater equality can help us develop the public ethos and commitment to work together which we need if we are going to solve the problems which threaten us all. As wartime leaders knew, if a society has to pull together, Policies must be seen to be fair, and income differences have to be reduced. 16. Building the Future Quote, Turning corporations loose and letting the profit motive run amuck is not a prescription for a more livable world. Unquote. Tom Schultz, Interview with the Sierra Club before discussing what should be done to make our societies more equal, it is worth pointing out that focusing attention on the inequalities within them does not mean ignoring the international inequalities between rich and poor countries. The evidence strongly suggests that narrowing income differences within rich countries will make them more responsive to the needs of poorer countries. In Chapter 4 we showed, Figure 4.6, that more equal countries tend to pay a higher proportion of their national income in foreign aid. Compared to the most unequal countries, some of the most equal devote four times the proportion of their national income to aid. More unequal countries also seem to be more belligerent internationally. Inequality is related to worse scores on the Global Peace Index, which combines measures of militarization with measures of domestic and international conflict and measures of security, human rights and stability. It is produced by visions of humanity in conjunction with the Economist Intelligence Unit. If we turn instead to the part countries play in international trade agreements, or for instance in negotiations on reducing carbon emissions, we find that more equal countries take positions on these issues which are likely to be more beneficial to developing countries. It looks as if the inequalities which affect the way people treat each other within their own societies also affect the norms and expectations they bring to bear on international issues. Growing up and living in a more unequal society affects people's assumptions about human nature. We have seen how inequality affects trust, community life and violence, and how, through the quality of early life, it predisposes people to be more or less affiliative, empathetic or aggressive. Obviously, these issues are closely related to the increased status competition and consumerism we discussed in the previous chapter. It implies that if we put our own houses in order, we may look more sympathetically on developing countries. A transformation. But how can we make our societies more equal? Talk about greater equality worries some people. 
Trying to allay these fears at a National Policy Association conference on health inequalities in Washington, one of us pointed out that as all the data came from rich developed market democracies and we were only talking about the differences between them, it surely wouldn't take a revolution to put things right. But when It Doesn't Take a Revolution appeared as the title of the National Policy Association's booklet from the conference, it was surprising to find a few people who thought it would. As Bill Kerry, one of the founders of the Equality Trust, put it, if we are going to achieve a major narrowing of income differences while responding effectively to global warming, what is required amounts to a transformation of our societies, a transformation which will not be furthered by a departure from peaceful methods, but one which is unlikely to be achieved by tinkering with minor policy options. A social movement for greater equality needs a sustained sense of direction and a view of how we can achieve the necessary economic and social changes. The key is to map out ways in which the new society can begin to grow within and alongside the institutions it may gradually marginalize and replace. That is what making change is really about. Rather than simply waiting for government to do it for us, we have to start making it in our lives and in the institutions of our society straight away. What we need is not one big revolution, but a continuous stream of small changes in a consistent direction. And to give ourselves the best chance of making the necessary transformation of society, we need to remember that the aim is to make a more sociable society, which means avoiding the disruption and dislocation which increase in security and fear and so often end in a disastrous backlash. The aim is to increase people's sense of security and to reduce fear, to make everyone feel that a more equal society not only has room for them, but also that it offers a more fulfilling life than is possible in a society dominated by hierarchy and inequality. In the past, when arguments about inequality centered on the privations of the poor and on what is fair, reducing inequality depended on coaxing or scaring the better off into adopting a more altruistic attitude to the poor. But now we know that inequality affects so many outcomes across so much of society, all that has changed. The transformation of our society is a project in which we all have a shared interest. Greater equality is the gateway to a society capable of improving the quality of life for all of us, and an essential step in the development of a sustainable economic system. It is often said that greater equality is impossible because people are not equal. But that is a confusion. Equality does not mean being the same. People did not become the same when the principle of equality before the law was established. Nor, as is often claimed, does reducing material inequality mean lowering standards or levelling to a common mediocrity. Wealth, particularly inherited wealth, is a poor indicator of genuine merit. Hence George Bernard Shaw's assertion that only where there is pecuniary equality can the distinction of merit stand out. Perhaps that makes Sweden a particularly suitable home for the system of Nobel Prizes. We see no indication that standards of intellectual, artistic or sporting achievement are lower in the more equal societies in our analyses. Indeed, making a large part of the population feel devalued can surely only lower standards. Although a baseball team is not a microcosm of society, a well-controlled study of over 1,600 players in 29 teams over a nine-year period found that Major League Baseball teams with smaller income differences among players do significantly better than the more unequal ones. And we saw in earlier chapters that more equal countries have higher overall levels of attainment in many different fields. The Policy Failure Politics was once seen as a way of improving people's social and emotional well-being by changing their economic circumstances. But over the last few decades, the bigger picture has been lost. People are now more likely to see psychosocial well-being as dependent on what can be done at the individual level using cognitive behavioral therapy, one person at a time, or on providing support in early childhood, or on the reassertion of religious or family values. However, it is now clear that income distribution provides policymakers with a way of improving the psychosocial well-being of whole populations, 
politicians have an opportunity to do genuine good. Attempts to deal with health and social problems through the provision of specialized services have proved expensive and at best only partially effective. Evaluations of even some of the most important services, such as police and medical care, suggest that they are not among the most powerful determinants of crime levels or standards of population health. Other services, such as social work or drug rehabilitation, exist to treat or process their various client groups, rather than to diminish the prevalence of social problems. On the occasions when government agencies do announce policies ostensibly aimed at prevention, at decreasing obesity, reducing health inequalities, or trying to cut rates of drug abuse, it usually looks more like a form of political window dressing, a display of good intentions intended to give the impression of a government actively getting to grips with problems. Sometimes, when policies will obviously fall very far short of their targets, you wonder whether even those who formulated them, or who write the official documents, ever really believed their proposals would have any measurable impact. Take health inequalities, for example. For ten years, Britain has had a government committed to narrowing the health gap between rich and poor. In an independent review of policy in different countries, a Dutch expert said Britain was ahead of other countries in implementing policies to reduce health inequalities. However, health inequalities in Britain have shown little or no tendency to decline. It is as if advisers and researchers of all kinds knew, almost unconsciously, that realistic solutions cannot be given serious consideration. Rather than reducing inequality itself, the initiatives aimed at tackling health or social problems are nearly always attempts to break the links between socio-economic disadvantage and the problems it produces. The unstated hope is that people, particularly the poor, can carry on in the same circumstances but will somehow no longer succumb to mental illness, teenage pregnancy, educational failure, obesity or drugs. Every problem is seen as needing its own solution, unrelated to others. People are encouraged to take exercise, not to have unprotected sex, to say no to drugs, to try to relax, to sort out their work-life balance and to give their children quality time. The only thing that many of these policies do have in common is that they often seem to be based on the belief that the poor need to be taught to be more sensible. The glaringly obvious fact that these problems have common roots in inequality and relative deprivation disappears from view. This is the end of the CD. The audiobook continues on the next CD.